Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. We begin our program today with a video message from the founder of the Duke Margolis Center, Dr. Robert Margolis. Ladies and gentlemen, I am really pleased today to invite you to participate in what we're excited is the two, uh, two year delayed five year anniversary of the Duke Health Policy Center. Originally, I also wanted this to be a celebration of Duke's sixth national basketball championship. They got really close. Uh, they're amazing. Coach K is amazing, but we didn't quite get there next year, I'm sure. So welcome to the inaugural Duke Health Policy Conference. And I'm speaking very confidently, I'm sure, on, also on behalf of our director, Mark McClellan, and the entire Duke uh, faculty, uh, researchers, students, staff, and saying, we're really thrilled you're joining us today in person and virtually. For this is a wonderful event and an important milestone for our Duke Health Policy Center. Seven years ago, Duke, my university uh, medical school, opportunity was amazing. And I've always had this strong affinity to what could be possible at Duke with its amazing clinical Duke health capabilities and research and the opportunity as an educational center to introduce generations of students, uh, both graduate and undergraduate to the opportunities in health policy. So working with Duke's leadership at the time and continuing, we were able to create a interdepartmental and interschool collaborative health policy center that has, in my view, and I think in the view of some others, exceeded all of our expectations. And we're very excited. The vision that really was grounding in my desire to combine Duke Health Policy with Duke Health and its amazing clinical information and research was the opportunity to create a, a venue to introduce hundreds and hundreds of future healthcare leaders to possible careers in improving the American healthcare system and indeed the global health care system through both vigorous research and possibility to implement improvements in a system that has amazing highs, but also very vulnerable inequities. And I think we've been able to create that kind of center through a strong partnership and leadership and collaboration. Under the leadership of Mark McClellan and Jillian Sander Schmidler in collaboration with so many of you, the center's impact on health policy and healthcare transformation, biomedical innovation, and the advancement of global health and health equity has, in my view, been extraordinary. Notably, the Duke Margolis comprehensive, nimble, and ever timely response to COVID-19 pandemic, I think stands out as a key example as how the center was flexible and was able to pivot to that crisis and create true and, and remarkable opportunities for improvement in the response to our COVID pandemic. Unlike some other health policy centers, the Duke Center has had a fundamental educational commitment to prepare this next generation of health leaders. Today, more than 70 of our Duke faculty are associated with the center and they join the team of 50 more researchers, both in our Durham and DC offices to engage, educate more than 400 graduate and undergraduate students at Duke. Many of you are here today, and I hope you all get a chance to intermingle with the very illustrative faculty that's come to present today and the guests that are here, both virtually and in person to improve your knowledge of the opportunities in health policy. We have an amazing lineup of speakers today and thank you all for your contributions to the special event. I want to especially thank uh, President Price, 
Sally Cornbooth, our provost, Mary Klotman, our dean at the medical school, been a wonderful supporter, Dean Ramos, Dean Bolding, for your collaboration with the Duke Health Policy Center. And lastly, I'd like to thank my good friend and colleague who I've known for many decades, Dr. Gene Washington, an enormous leader of Duke Health and a strong supporter of Duke Health Policy. So with that, let me turn the podium over to Gene and to wish you all a very productive and informative conference. And I hope there are many more to come in our future. Thank you so much. Thanks to Bob. And uh, I think you all will join me in expressing regret that he can't be here in, in person. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome. It is a great pleasure for me to be joining all of you this afternoon on this very auspicious occasion. And thank you for uh, participating in what I know will be a stimulating uh, and robust discussion that will lead to valuable exchange of information and ideas. Uh, nearly seven years ago, Bob, Lisa, Provost Cornbrew, and others at Duke had the foresight and sagacity to envision a center that would bridge our academic mission with health policy to have real world impact on advancing health and health equity. Just about five years after its establishment, we can say unequivocally that the Duke Margolis Health Policy Center has done just that. We have just come through a unique time in our history and now more than ever, we understand the unique role that policy matters play in addressing specific health goals, whether it is in alleviating human suffering, enhancing health and well being, eliminating social and health disparities here and around the world. The Margolis Center has been an exceptional partner in addressing and formulating guidance for many of the health and social challenges facing us today. And while continuing to advance the very best in actionable policy, the center has also become an invaluable part of our, academ of our academic mission, offering numerous courses in undergraduate and graduate level education and leading high quality research on critically important issues such as AI-enabled clinical decision-making, strategies for effective vaccine distribution, improvements in drug and device development, improvements in value-based care, a subject that is on all of our minds, and engaging patients more effectively in their care. None of this would be possible without the incredible faculty staff and students at the Margolis Center and an absolutely phenomenal leadership team. I have the great pleasure of introducing a member of the leadership team here today, Dr. Mark McCullen. Dr. McCullen is the founding director of the Duke Margolis Center. He is a physician economist, a former administrator of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and former commissioner of the FDA. While leading the center since its launch, Mark has also been at the forefront of the nation's effort to combat the pandemic. He is the author of the COVID-19 response roadmap and co-author of a comprehensive set of works to address the public health emergency that spans virus containment and testing strategies reforming healthcare towards more resilient models of delivering better care, more equitable care, accelerating the development of therapeutics and vaccines, and building a more robust global response to the pandemic. I now have the great pleasure of inviting my colleague and my friend, Mark McClellan, to say a few words. Mark? 
Gene, Gene uh, th thank you very much. Uh, Bob, uh, virtually, thank you very much. Uh, as uh, Gene mentioned, I'm Mark McClellan, the director of the center here. I'm also an independent board member at Alignment Healthcare, Cigna and Johnson and Johnson. And it is truly an honor to be here with such an amazing collection of speakers, collaborators, and friends not only to celebrate our first five years at Duke Margolis, but also to look forward together to the issues and opportunities in front of us as we continue to work towards a healthier and more equitable future with affordable health care. This fifth anniversary, as you heard, has an asterisk. We had originally planned this event for last uh, year, but uh, COVID got in the way, as you uh, all have lived through. Five years with the pandemic definitely seems longer, uh, but it's been a tremendous experience to work with uh, Duke Margolis team members, the faculty, the students, and all of the collaborators that make up, that make Duke Margolis what it is today. This was only possible at Duke, and it was only possible thanks to the vision of people including Bob Margolis, Gene Washington, Richard Broadhead, and Vince Price, and the rest of the Duke leadership. They all believed in this unique approach to influencing healthcare today and for the future. It is a university-wide approach, as you heard from Gene and Bob, because the problems that we're seeking to address truly require bringing together a wide range of perspectives and expertise. It is in the world. We have a strong Washington, D.C. base. We have engagement with stakeholders and state leaders in Raleigh and around the country. And with those implementing programs here in the United States and around the world, because the really hard part of health reform isn't just the good ideas and the research publications, those are important contributors, but it's also engaging stakeholders and collaborators in the hard learnings of putting the ideas into practice. With new approaches to education and learning at every level, that's a third feature, new approaches to, to learning and education at every le level, because leaders in health reform can come from anywhere. Medicine, nursing, business, arts and sciences, engineering, lived experiences, and these future leaders benefit not just from a great academic curriculum, which Duke can provide, but also from getting out there and working together on the complex problems that make up health reform. And they've given us some patience and flexibility and willingness to adapt because we're st still learning and growing in this program. Duke's unique approach to education and collaboration, the institutional culture at Duke to back it up, all reflected in what I would call anti-siloed financial support for its academic programs has made the Duke Margolis Center possible. And we are also here in no small measure thanks to all of you. Today, we're joined in person and virtually by many friends and collaborators and supporters, and by many more people who care deeply about successful health reform. You all provide the ideas, you all provide the energy and the heart, uh, the debates, the critiques, everything that makes our work possible with much more to come. And I also wanna thank our very special sponsors for providing the generous support for today's events. Lynn Zadowski, Joel Marcus, and the entire team at Alexandria Real Estate Equities, and Mark Samuels, Louis Jacques, and their colleagues at AVI. Thank you for your support, the ideas, and the friendship and appreciation for our mission. And I know today we're joined by a number of other donors and maybe some potential financial supporters as well for our mission. I want to thank you all for the support, the ideas, the friendship, and again, the commitment to mission here. Um, now, obviously, it wouldn't be a Duke Margolis celebration if we didn't talk policy and healthcare reform. We've got a full agenda for that this afternoon. We'll be covering the outlook from here on COVID and future public health threats and implications for healthcare and public health. We'll talk about the challenges and new opportunities to transform healthcare and deliver more value and equity. We'll talk about new supports and new directions for biomedical innovation that can make a difference with better evidence and attention to sustainability and access as well as true breakthroughs. And we'll have some global perspectives on all of these issues as well. We're gonna end though with the fundamental importance of helping diverse future reform leaders and helping to develop a healthcare workforce that can create better health in the years ahead that meets each person where they are that helps them halt, if not reverse, the disease burdens they face, 
and it does it all equitably and at a sustainable cost. And uh, Administrator Chiquita brooks Shore is going to help us uh, close out on some of those important themes related to health equity. Just a few logistical notes before we get started. First, uh, we are aiming for a safe event. We've required proof of vaccination, symptom screening, and we're also strongly encouraging mask use while you're here today and not on stage. We have them available, and we're going to talk a little bit more about COVID uh, um, sustainability in, uh, in, in just a, a few minutes and COVID events. Uh, we won't be able to take audience questions today due to the packed agenda, but there are opportunities to add to the conversation online. Our Twitter handle is at Duke Margolis, and the hashtag for today's event is hash, uh, hashtag Duke Margolis Policy Conf, C-O-N-F, Duke Margolis Policy Conf. For those of you who are joining us here, we hope you stay for reception afterwards in the big hall outside this room at five o'clock to continue the dialogue and meet many of the people who make Duke Margolis uh, what it is. A lot of people are up from, from Durham today and from our other uh, collaboration spots around the, the country. For all of you, please do stay in touch. Check our website. You can sign up for our newsletter. Follow us. And also, we'll make today's discussion available on the Duke Margolis website for future viewing. This will be our first annual event in a series of health policy conferences. So we'd also like your feedback on what we can do uh, to improve this for future conferences. If you look at in your program, there's a QR link in the back uh, where you can give us some feedback, and we'd really appreciate that. So with that, I'd like to bring up two colleagues and longtime collaborators at Duke Margolis for our first session on the path forward with COVID-19 and the implications for healthcare and how we approach future public health threats. Um, so please uh, uh, come on up. I'd like to welcome Scott Gottlieb, who's Senior Fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and Independent Director at Pfizer, Andy Slavitt, General Partner at Town Hall Ventures, um, uh, as well as a contributor to a, a range of, of policy issues, including serving as a Senior Advisor for the White House COVID-19 Task Force at the beginning of the Biden administration. Uh, all of you, thanks, and uh, figure out your spot and spacing, uh, whatever else you're, you're working on over there. Um, so uh, glad to have you with us. Let's see, I'll... Uh, um, We're trying to socially distance. <laughs> I know, well, you're just, um, we'll make this work, uh, but... Um, Go scoot over. <laughs> as you can see, we do, not, we do not script all of these events. So I, we did try to count up, though, how many events and papers and initiatives um, we've worked on together um, with Scott and Andy uh, here at um, Duke Margolis uh, during the pandemic, and it's a lot, and that's only a fraction of the all the work that, that Scott and Andy have done related to the public health emergency. Um, Andy, as I mentioned, you went back into government service. Um, you're continuing to advise the Office of Science and Technology policy on, on pandemic issues. Scott, um, you've uh, done a lot of commentary on current trends. I think you set the Face the Nation record or pretty close to it uh, uh, over the last couple of years. You're almost there, right? Um, uh, just uh, displaying some of the kind of communication skills that we really need in a public health emergency. Um, maybe we could start with, with you, Scott, on some of the um, recent trends. You've been commenting on these, uh, I think, uh, today, too. So we still are at a low prevalence level of COVID overall, not as low as it looks, but uh, relatively low. Um, some regional outbreaks, cases are going up again nationally, are going up faster in uh, some areas of the country, including uh, here on, on the East Coast. But also you've talked about how the current trends, trends seem less likely to become another national epidemic anytime soon, maybe at all, um, and not progressing the severest, and we're not seeing the, the consequences for severe illness and, uh, uh, and health impacts. So I wanted to ask you, with us here today, um, uh, this is our first Duke Margolis in-person event in over two years. Many of our attendees preferred to participate virtually. Um, how likely are events like this one to turn into spreader events? And, and now, <laughs> at this point uh, in the pandemic, um, what are the, the kinds of steps that, that we should be taking? Well, th thanks for having me. The, uh, you know, this will probably be my last major super spreader event this season <laughs> until we get into the summer um, when things should be quiet. And look, I, I, there is more infection right now than what we're measuring. Right now, if you look at prevalence, um, we, we're going through a BA2 surge here in the Mid-Atlantic, the Northeast, probably parts of Florida, which track the East Coast. 
um, prevalence still looks very low. Hospitalizations are ticking up just a little bit, but I think we're measuring a fraction of cases. If before we were probably, the ascertainment was one in four to one in three cases, we're probably at one in seven, one in eight right now, and that may be optimistic. And so you look at 30,000 infections a day nationally, it's probably more like a quarter of a million, and it's, and it's probably very concentrated here in the East Coast. The question is whether or not this sort of B2 wave has a big impact and does it spread nationally. I think it won't have a big impact and it won't spread nationally because I think by the time it, it kind of gets, you know, really into the East Coast, and we're probably peaking right now, even though we don't know it, uh, it's going to be warm months, you'll have the summer backstop, and this will kind of burn out. Much like B117 burned out last year, we had that sort of wave of infection coming off Delta. It was mostly concentrated in the East Coast, and then things really started to plummet. And we had a really pretty good June and July until Delta, Delta started to come along, coming off of beta, excuse me. I think the same thing's going to happen here. B2 will become epidemic in some parts of the country. It already is. And then as we kind of get into May, it's going to just collapse, and then we'll have sort of a quiescent May, June, July. And then the question becomes what happens later in the year. In terms of impact, I think it's less likely to have a substantial impact because, quite frankly, a lot of the people who are getting infected with B2 right now are people who didn't get infected with B1. And so there are people who tended on the whole, obviously there's exceptions and there'll be a lot of exceptions, but on the whole, there'll be people who were more likely to be vaccinated, more likely to wear masks, more likely to test early because they were vigilant. I mean, anyone who avoided getting infected during the last Omicron surge on the whole probably was being more careful. If they're being more careful, they're probably more likely to have immunity, have vaccination, less likely to end up in the hospital. So I think that this is gonna have less impact overall because of the demographic that is going to affect. The question becomes what happens as we get into the late summer? Do we have another big surge in the South like we've had every year? And there, there's a couple of different scenarios. One is that B2 does start to spread in the South as they rush indoors for air conditioning in August. Um, you have waning immunity. If you look right now, for example, in Florida, Florida is the fifth worst in getting their population boosted. So a state that did a very good job getting their population vaccinated. DeSantis was very aggressive getting uh, particularly the older population vaccinated at the outset has fallen off on boosters. And so that's a vulnerability. You're going to have declining immunity on top of that. So B2 could become um, prevalent in the parts of the country where we've seen those late summer surges before. And then the, the other variable is what happens with B4, B5, these two variants that have emerged in Botswana and South Africa, which all have this L452 mutation, this mutation that seems to give it some added ability to evade the existing vaccines, do those start to come into the US um, and um, spread more easily in a population that's even been previously infected with Omicron? And that's another possibility. And I think that's a possibility that probably is gonna cause regulators to think more carefully about switching over to an Omicron specific booster in the fall, if in fact we're seeing that the future mutations are happening within the Omicron lineage and Omicron itself is gradually developing mutational, a mutational load that gives it more and more ability to evade the current vaccines, which is what B4 and B5 kind of represent. I don't think they're a problem for now, but they could be something that as we come back in the fall, late summer, fall, they become the more prevalent strain here in the US rather than B2. Um, final point, I mean, the good news is that B, B1 and B2 do, do seem to provide good immunity against B4 and B5 based on the very early evidence we have. And so, you know, probably a very, probably 60% of the population of moral have been infected with Omicron by the time we're done with this current wave. And so there'll be a lot of baseline immunity. So uh, there's a comprehensive overlook on how things are, are likely to proceed to the extent we can predict it from here. I wanna come back to some of those issues. Um, it does seem to mean for now, Andy, um, uh, kind of reflected in what some of the administration lead spokespeople, Tony Fauci, um, uh, Ashish Jha, have been saying, which is essentially COVID's going to be with us. Um, it's it's uh, present in the community. We're going to continue to see uh, outbreaks, but the administration seems to be seems to have moved to more of a individual decision basis. So we're not we're not seeing a lot of mass mandates. Although Philadelphia just imposed one, while telling everyone to please go about their lives, just wear a mask indoors. Um, and maybe related to that, to, you know, today uh, um, I see everybody, uh, most people around the, the room wearing masks. And that's what we had encouraged. Uh, we're working with um, uh, here at the Reagan Center where they've done a lot of upgrades in their um, uh, ventilation systems, air circulation, things like that. 
should people be going about their, their normal lives? Is, are we at a point where it's um, uh, up to the individuals given all the immunity that Scott mentioned as well as availability of tests? Uh, I know you tested uh, just before that. I tested Maybe, last yeah. night and sent it to uh, Mark. So if I got COVID, I could blame him. <laughs> tests, uh, treatments available, vaccines. And we just talked about uh, some of the boosters that are coming. Yeah, well, first of all, congratulations to you and to the center. Thank you. Bob. Um, Thank you. You guys have become in a short amount of time a critical part of the landscape. And if I think you want to get something done and done well and thoughtfully in healthcare, many people now know to come to Duke Margolis and to come to you and your team. Um, so really, I hope people get to honor that. Uh, look, I was, I was talking to David Ho the other day who said, um, in, a, in a sense, in the 1919 pandemic, it was over when the public decided it was over. Um, and that there were a lot of deaths in that third year. But at the end of the second year, um, the public had just said, you know, kind of, we're done. And I think we all know that in this society, there's a certain sense that when the majority feels safe and ready to move on, that sort of decides it for everybody. But we'd be wrong to think of it as over or not over binary, there's some adjusting we need to do to our thinking. Um, the narrative that we had that, you know, initially that I wear a mask to protect you and you wear a mask to protect me. And um, the fact that if you get um, a vaccine, it, pre it, it prevents me from spreading the, vi the virus. All those things have not really been fully unlearned by the public. The truth is, um, we are blessed to have many tools today, um, that if we use them in, in layer them with our own pre-existing immunity um, allows most people to be able to be, you know, fairly safe or safe enough um, that it makes sense for people to feel like they, need, they can go full steam ahead. And so we've moved from um, a mandate to a website. Um, now, the truth is there's a world in between a mandate and a website, which is, you know, right now the public feels like if, if I'm supposed to be wearing a mask, my governor or my restaurant or my mayor will mandate it. And if they don't, that probably means I don't need to wear a mask. And so there is a higher level of communication required to say to people, just because it's not mandated, that's actually why you should be making smarter personal decisions based upon your own circumstances. And so um, we're not good at sending these middle signals. We either send the signal everybody wears or everybody doesn't. We'll have a big decision to make with, with airplanes coming up shortly. And I can assure you that if the government decides not to require masks on airlines anymore, a lot of people won't. And um, a lot of people will, will um, question that. If they decide to wear them, um, then it'll send a strong signal that you should. But you know, we shouldn't end up at a point where the airlines say, you no longer need to wear a mask. Scott chooses to wear a mask and people ridicule him or goes to school and that becomes odd. We've got we've to come to a more subtle place where people can make these individual decisions, businesses, individuals, schools, based upon circumstances, use the tools available and get by because we're not going back. Um, I don't think we're going back, even if we see um, a worst case scenario than what Scott described, um, I think it's unlikely to see us um, going back in that direction. And that means that Ashish has a tougher job. Uh, local public health uh, departments have a tougher job. Um, and, um, um, you know, we all each individually um, really have to take seriously understanding what these individual risks and exposures are. And look, I don't, I'm someone who, like, I, I'm a baby when I get the flu. So, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to be sick. Um, and my wife definitely doesn't want me to be sick because then I'm asking her to make me soup and a bunch of other stuff and she doesn't want to do that. So, you know, it's very reasonable for us to say, hey, let's take some responsibility for ourselves and for others. If you are sick, don't go out, right? We're going to have to start to, to see if we can move to a place where we take the rhetoric down can, and then doing that can count on one another again to... Um, to just pr to protect ourselves better, because that's the reality of where we are, whether whether we want to be there or not. I think the you know, just can I say one thing. Yeah, yeah. I think the, the critical question is: is the future evolution of this virus going to be within the Omicron lineage, 
or are we going to see another episode of divergent evolution like Omicron was, where you get a strain that um, is able to pierce the immunity we've acquired and maybe has a higher case fatality rate? Because after all, Delta was a more virulent um, strain. It, so it actually had evolved to become more virulent when Delta came along. So it is possible that it can evolve in the direction of becoming more virulent. I think the, the sort of base assumption is that the future mutations are going to be within the Omicron lineage, although I thought that the future mutations would be within the Delta lineage until Omicron came along. Um, and the longer that we go on with nothing really divergent coming along, the more likely that scenario becomes. And like, so B4 and B5 may represent an early indication of what that future um, evolution within Omicron is going to look like. If in fact that's the reality, I think everything Andy said is absolutely right. If we have divergent evolution with something that potentially is more virulent and it is able to pierce the immunity, um, we're in trouble because we should be going back to the mitigation, but it's going to be very hard to get people to do it. Um, and so that becomes the really difficult scenario, I think. Well, yeah. let's talk about that in the in the policy context, because Andy and, and you both have laid out a nice path forward for trying to change source of social norms in a reasonable way, bring down the volume of issues that tend to come up in conjunction with mandates and and, and people just looking differently about what requirements should be. That could be a much more challenging situation in the future. We just don't know if those kinds of um, shift um, um, rather than drift variants are, are going to come along. But in the meantime, we have to make some policy decisions. So the public health emergency may not end right away. Anybody want to make a prediction from the administration? I'm predicting not right away for, for a number of reasons. July 16th. Period, something like that sounds, yeah. uh, sounds yeah. about and I, right. Look, and, I, and I think you can imagine a staggered end. And by that, I mean, mm -hmm. um, it, you know, end it, declare it over, but take a bunch of the popular provisions that we're not ready to end and give them a, extend them through uh, through administrative action. Kind of a can, you, can you do that though without legislation? You either declare, because a lot of the provisions flow from the declaration. Can you partially declare it? I don't think they have a lot of latitude, but I, I think that, I think the lawyers are probably a lot of currently looking at that right, right now, now. <laughs> but you know, I think we all know By the time you end up in court right. is two years later. Is that the sort of thing? But, but I want to talk about, I want to talk about some, maybe some of the less popular provisions. So, um, so COVID is not ending. We just talked about different possible scenarios. Um, there are seems like a clear need for further legislative action to prepare for and, and uh, uh, make sure we're well defended against these potential scenarios. But if you look out at the legislative um, picture right now, there does seem to be a fair amount of consensus in one area, which is that the biomedical progress we've seen leading up to and in the pandemic has been tremendous. So widespread availability of rapid testing, um, availability of effective oral and intravenous therapeutics, keeping our vaccines up to date for Omicron and so forth. There's bipartisan legislation pending in Congress to at least expend, extend that for a while longer. There's the PREVENT Act, that bipartisan legislation supported by um, uh, Chair Murray, Senator Burr, which strengthens, um, aims to strengthen supply chains and make for more robust, um, more manufacturing, something we've all written about. Um, that all seems good uh, in terms of long-term preparedness. Where there seems to be less or no consensus is what's the future of the federal public health system and state and local support for that? How do we take those kinds of technologies that should make it possible to turn any future surge, like Scott, you were describing, into a manageable um, uh, uh, set of national consequences in terms of limited impact on hospitalizations and severe cases and economic disruption? But without the rest of the picture, it seems like it's going to be hard to do that. Um, any kind, is, does that, what's your assessment of the legislative and policy outlook here? And how do we address those issues while keeping the, 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 um, uh, the, the conflict level? Yeah, I mean, the politics. I think that, that there is an underappreciation for how much that the sort of public health community has taken a hit through COVID. Right or wrong, there is a perception that they were overly empowered, um, made issued guidance that wasn't well informed, didn't re-adjudicate it in a timely fashion, was sort of doctrinaire. A lot of this flows from CDC. Um, I think a lot of it's fair, some of it's unfair, but it is the pervasive um, perception. And I, and I think in the sort of broader community, a lot of people look in on this and they say, this is a right-left debate. You know, this is conservatives and Republicans who are shooting at the public health establishment. And I think if, when you look at the polling data, it's actually much 
broader than that. There is a, a large portion of the public, certainly a majority, who feel that public health agencies um, didn't act responsibly, didn't act in timely fashion, didn't act on good information, didn't issue practical guidance. And so there's- And, and the mandates that were issued too. And the mandates that were issued weren't properly titrated. You know, a mask mandate in one setting, maybe don't mandate in another. You're gonna mandate vaccination. You know, I, I always felt the sort of employer mandate was a bridge too far and they shouldn't have done that. It was an overreach. And so, you know, it's, if any effective policymaking, to, to your point, your sort of um, list of things that Congress has done and, sh and you kind of intimate what they should do, is predicated, in my view, on empowering public health institutions, resourcing them, empowering them, um, giving public health institutions greater authorities, properly, you know, um, guardrailed. And I think there's a real reluctance to do that. I do not think you're going to get a political consensus in Congress around anything that actually properly empowers public health institutions. So then the question becomes, what's the alternative? And that's what we that, talk that about. That is the next question. Right, the health, the, turning to the health system. But I think that this is going to be a much harder lift than Capitol Hill. Yeah. And it's not just Republicans. This isn't just a right-left divide. So people who dismiss it as that, I think, are are not capturing the true zeitgeist. Now, I was up on the Hill last week, two weeks ago, you remember. Um, and I was talking to Republican members, and there is no there was no discussion of how to elevate the public health function. It was how to we're going to authorize CDC. CDC is not officially authorized. Its its authorities flow from the secretary, and we're going to look for ways to constrain it. Now they don't they're not going to do that because they don't they don't really know how. There's not a lot of people on the Hill who understand the agency and, well. And there's enough. not consensus on that. And how to do it, but even to go in and do it in the way that Congress legislated. FDA's authority is much more clearly. There's no ability to do it. I think it should happen. And I think it should happen in a way that empowers CDC more in certain respects, maybe constrains them in others. It's not going to happen. But to your point, the idea that there's going to be very ambitious policymaking to expand the public health footprint in this country and the things you talked about were small ball, you know, funding the therapeutics for another six months, that there's going to be something more global in scope. I don't think that there's a consensus to actually go in and properly empower CDC and public health agencies where they ought to be further empowered, like yeah, they, data collection. I, I do wanna come back to that. I wanna come back to the what this means for the healthcare system as well, where there may be some more consensus or opportunity, we'll see. Um, there is a provision in the that prevent legislation for, uh, I guess they're calling it a task force, but something to create a, uh, something like a national commission that would enable maybe a, a deeper, longer term look at this, but that doesn't get you to any legislation in the short term. Andy, your thoughts on this? Sure. And I would like to talk about the implications sure. for healthcare. Sure. Well, look, I think, I, think, I think Scott's right. If anybody here doesn't think that public health as a whole is in worse shape than they were before the pandemic, then they're not paying attention to the politics. Um, uh, now there are a lot of people that will come out of the pandemic and say, if there's not a clarion call for reinvesting in public health, where would be where would there be? Uh, but there are, uh, a, I think, another people that set of people that Scott describes well. Um, it's probably not entirely left right, but uh, but certainly um, I think this is more from a from a lawmaker standpoint. There's more Republicans in this camp. Who feel like these you know people have been overly empowered, didn't deliver, um, and that the public has re really little appetite to let um, public health uh, take such control. And I think they they probably mistake a couple of issues because um, we do need to invest in some really important things. And so the way around this problem is reform. Um, the way around this problem is to take a deep, hard look and say, don't fund me in my in my current form, but let me take a deep look at what you should invest in uh, for this country. And, um, and you know, that, that is gonna take some time, uh, but I think it's appropriate that there is some of that setback and some of, the, some of those lessons learned. I will, I will say though that the people, there are a lot of people working on this that I think do feel like endless funds ought to be flowing to prevent the next pandemic. And then there's another set of people saying, well, prove to me you can stop the next pandemic. Cause do you have, you, you know, you didn't really gain our confidence yeah, so this is this is a moment where we could actually end up further back than we started, and that'll match public attitudes. There are people that are further back in terms of their belief in vaccines, and their faith in institutions, and their faith in science. So um, we just have to start with that reality because it calls to, to question some of these things that do need to happen and need to happen anyway. So unless we're going to bury 
you know, bury this in a bill to support Ukraine or to fight inflation, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Um, and and I think we all ought to hear that as a call to action, not as a not as a reason to despair. We ought to hear that as a um, call to say, how do we, for wherever we sit in the health system, participate? Um, in ways that can capitalize on these things and make them successful. And, you know, the cycles will come back. I mean, there will be a point in time uh, for whatever reason, maybe it'll be um, a disruptive variant or something else when, when there will be more opportunity for funding and more opportunity to invest. But for right now, I think, you know, there's things that we know make sense, having warm sites available so that you can um, develop the biomedical technology when you need it, um, you know, Pfizer, uh, Pfizer didn't participate in in warp speed. Um, we have capabilities as a private sector. The the private healthcare system learned how to be, in many respects, a public health system in probably better ways than than they know. There there is the ability to collect and share data. There has to be some agreement on standards, but it's not beyond the scope yeah. of our capabilities. And then and then finally, we have to figure out how to make sure that in the process people don't get dropped. And by, by that, I simply mean that the fact that no one had to think about whether or not a vaccine, a booster, um, or, a, or a therapy was something they had to pay for out of their own pockets was enormously important, enormously important. In many respects, it is people's, people's first experience with Bernie Sanders' system, right? Which is to say, whatever, what happens if we don't have these barriers? There are still access issues. But um, if we leave people out in a public health emergency and say, you got to pay a $5 copay or a $10 copay, um, you know, we will be erecting barriers that we can't enact. So this is, this is a place where the public sector and the private sector, everything from the pools we've built to pay for uninsured care to, um, re to regulations on how to pay for public health capabilities, we need to be creative. We need to come together because if we, this public health emergency ends and we just basically take... 10% of the population and say, you can no longer get access to a vaccine without paying out of your own pocket. Um, we, you know, in based on your immigration status, based on something else, um, we're going to create gaping holes. Well, let, yeah, let's talk about that. One, one okay, very quick. You, you're losing I, you want to get, panels. I know. It's, uh, you I know, know, I, I would, um, I, I would take the prevention, I would make the Centers for Disease Control the Centers for Disease Control and move the and prevention they've been a, out. They've been emphasizing the and prevention well, for the last few decades. Right. And, and, it's, to get to more. and it's migrated the, the agency away from its core sort of um, national security mindset and mission. There's the things that they do on the prevention side. I'm not saying they're not important, but FDA can do smoking cessation. The ASH can do heart disease. A lot of that can move to NIH. I, I think the way to get consensus here, to Andy's point, is you're going to have to give them stronger authorities in certain respects. I think you can get consensus around the disease right. control mission, focus on that, give it more of a national security veneer, and then move some of the other softer okay. epidemiology. I'll, I'll actually grant you that was a relevant point. It tells me that there's a next <laughs> transition to what is what else is feasible in terms of legislation. Um, so if, if CDC is not going to emphasize prevention, who is? Because we're definitely in a stage in the pandemic where um, again, we've got uh, tests that can work, special for, especially for people who are, at, who are high risk, if they get tested quickly, uh, if they can get in that, that, disease control. that test to treat pathway into treatment uh, for their condition to prevent serious complications, if they can get um, vaccination and boosted properly. The healthcare system has come off better in this pandemic. I mean, we've done worse in many ways as a country in terms of population level, mortality, hospitalization, waves, and so forth. But boy, there have been heroic efforts in wave after wave. It seems like though what we need for the future is more a healthcare system that can adapt to these new technologies that can help connect that, that's, that's first of all, is trusted by the public much more than um, you know, government agencies are now. Maybe it was uh, Bernie Sanders' co-pays, it was a private sector health system that, that delivered them. And there are examples of test to treat programs, of outreach programs, you know, some of the organizations you work with, Andy, and some that we do at, at Duke Margolis that have done a really good job of identifying their high risk patients, even low income you know, Medicaid beneficiaries or others, yeah. uh, and getting them into test to treat, monitoring them, 
uh, proactively working with public health on, um, on vaccination gaps and things like that, but it certainly isn't systematic. I and mean, we're using only a small fraction of the monoclonal antibodies we have. Uh, Paxlovid has really picked up, picked up, but it's still very unevenly used in high-risk individuals around the country. We're not yet at a point where the next surge, if there is one, could be a, a surge in, um, treat, in, in testing and, and treatment and containment rather than a surge in hospitalization. I feel, I feel bad for interrupting Mark. Yeah, so can, no, no, you, so I'd like to talk about legislation start, and then start there. And, 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 and we've only got a few minutes left, so. Uh, <laughs> so. I only interrupt him. Okay, no, you can interrupt me anytime. Um, look, I'm actually more worried about the labor crisis than I, in, in, in the healthcare system than I am about the medical technology. Um, you know, I think, hey, look, we have probably have, without question, more nurses and doctors today in this country than we will ever have at any point in the future. It may never get 70 to 80% of where we are today. And I don't think we've thought about how to operate the healthcare system as a whole, even without a public health crisis at that, at that level. And um, that you know, there, there's buried good news in there, probably if we take advantage of it, and that we are going to have to reinvent what gets done in institutions and in hospitals and with high, clinical labor content, uh, we're just gonna have no choice uh, because the, the burnout um, is, was, was already present. Now it's extraordinary. And, um, and not to mention the, the, the labor challenges we're gonna have across the economy and have, have anyway. Um, and then, you know, hospitals are gonna essentially say, my labor costs are going up dramatically. Who's gonna pay for that? And, you know, the truth is, um, that is, a, that is going to be an extraordinarily tough question uh, to answer as well. So, you know, the, the healthcare systems we have um, are going to be under incredible strain. And uh, there's going to have to be um, some reconciling of how it performs and what we expect of it and um, what it does at the community and local level. Um, but in the middle of it all, there's some, there are some extraordinarily good things happening. Um, I talked the other day to um, the head of the Mount Sinai Long COVID Center, the Re Long COVID Rehab Center. Um, you know, there, there is a, um, a much stronger theory of the case today and understanding of what's going on with the Vegas, the Vegas nerve. You may be following some of this, Scott, um, that is driving um, uh, long COVID symptoms and, a, and there's about a 70% success rate at Mount Sinai for being able to rehabilitate people through lifestyle changes and uh, physical therapy and a few other, uh, few other things. Um, as, they, and as they get closer and closer to the cause of the event, that, that's gonna go up. So we're gonna ex need to expect a bunch of new things, including um, distributing the therapies that we talked about. We're gonna have to expect um, the life sciences industry to create more, there's gonna have to be more Paxlovids, we know this, um, because we have, um, you know, we're gonna develop some immunity. We're going to, so there's gonna be a constant rush of things to be done. And if we develop the administrative steps and legislative steps to, to advance this enough, I mean, it seems like there is more consensus about these kinds of steps than in some of the public. I, you know, I wonder if it can be done in a way that is, to, to take your earlier question, less, focused on supporting public health and more focused on some of the reforms we'd like to see in the healthcare system, along with virtual care, at-home care, the kinds of things that are gonna address the labor crisis um, that maybe don't expressly focus on public health, but, but focus on the role of our private healthcare system um, in that development. We, we've done it before. I mean, post 9-11, we funded the availability of certain capacities in the healthcare system that we actually piggybacked on during the early days of the pandemic, particularly in, in New York. I mean, there is a sort of conceptual model. In your book talk about how good of a response there was even before. That was that mothballed was, yeah. because yeah. of some post 9-11 planning, but there is a, a model for thinking about how we build capacities into the delivery system to take on some more of these public health functions. And it's going to be easier politically, I think, to achieve that. So like testing surges, Test, treatments. Exactly. Surges. Building in the capacities and Making funding. Making sure high-risk people are vaccinated, things right. like that. Rather than funding public health institutions, which isn't optimal in its own right, but I think politically it's going to be easier to achieve. I agree with that. 
any final thoughts? We've got just a couple of minutes left and uh, you, you never know where these conversations are gonna go with you two, I have to say, but uh, this, this has been, it's been um, uh, really informative. Um, any final thoughts on, on these points? Uh, Andy, I know you've worked a lot on, you mentioned telehealth and some of these innovative care models. Um, any final thoughts on that front? And, and then yeah. Scott? Well, look, I think you're gonna hear a lot today about health equity um, from, uh, from CMS. I know you've got city block here. Um, we have people who've been focusing on, on those issues. And, and I'll go back to where we started, which is the majority decides we move on there are still tens of millions of people um, at risk because of their job content, because of their family health histories, because of their personal medical situation, because of their age. Uh, and then if another variant comes along, there'll be another risk factor or two um, that don't feel quite so safe. And um, who basically work with the public every day and have to rely upon other people's behavior in a way that puts them more at risk. Doesn't describe most of the people here, most of us, many of us can work from home. Many of us have, the, have these other options, but we tend to very quickly forget about this group. And I would say, you know, we spent, we spent more time than we should ever, ever spend again during the AIDS crisis, um, just letting people suffer. Uh, so I think there is, a, there is a lens from, thanks to this administration, thanks to some innovative companies, thanks to some other things going on um, that says, we can't just accept that as a status quo. Let me give you one quick story. When we were sending, when we opened up our first federal just, uh, vaccination site, we opened it up in Oakland, California at the Coliseum. And the first day there, it was packed with people from San Francisco and people who probably never been to the Oakland Coliseum. And we opened up our second center in East LA and it was packed with people from Beverly Hills who probably never been to East LA before to get their vaccines. And it was a lesson for me in if you really want to address health equity, you have to actually take the extra steps. And it took for us to say, hey, wait a minute, there are gonna be times uh, before and after work when only people from the zip code should be able to come in and get vaccinated um, because there are so many structural disadvantages that people face to getting, to getting vaccinated. And it, you know, the, the, the whole crisis sped up all of the inequities that happen in a sort of an extended slow motion way that, that are harder to see, but it sped them up really quickly. So there's a lot we can take advantage of in terms of these lessons learned. We can, there are innovative ways to make sure, you know, we're caring for people responsibly and giving them more access. Uh, we can't forget that. Scott, you get the next to last word. Yeah, look, there's been a lot of, um, I'll just go in a little bit different direction. There's been a lot of uh, delivery innovation in this pandemic. And if, if you ask me what I think is the most profound sort of regulatory innovation that led to delivery change, it's the advent of the home test for COVID. If you would have asked me five years ago, would FDA ever allow someone to self-diagnose at home for a infectious a communicable reportable pathogen and not have to report the results, I would have said, no, no way, yeah. it's never gonna happen. And it, and it happened. And I think it opens up a whole plethora of opportunities now to self-diagnose at home for a range of conditions, strep throat, RSV, flu. I think we can move much more care into the home when you have diagnostics available to consumers and you can couple it with a telehealth visit. But, but ultimately it's gonna to need to be also be coupled with a definitive test, the ability to send off an overnight test and get a definitive answer when there's an equivocal result on a home test or the symptoms match, but the home test doesn't, the doctor wants that definitive test and doesn't want to have to pull the patient into the office for it. Uh, someone's going to have to pull that together. If we could pull that together, that would be a profound innovation in the care delivery system and probably would like account for 70% of pediatric visits. It's going to take someone like Amazon to do it or some organization like that that has the logistics to deliver all three simultaneously. But that is a real opportunity with COVID and it's gonna become more important in the future to have that kind of a platform because we're gonna to have to differentiate COVID from RSV from flu in the future. The technology is there to do it, the delivery vehicle isn't. Well, and we're gonna come right in this next panel to some of the changes that, that might help as you all both referenced in the healthcare system to help get there. So- Is that a good segue? Thanks for a great uh, discussion <laughs> and for, for eliminating my need for a segue. Great to, <laughs> great to be here with you all. Um, and so with that, I wanna end this panel and also uh, bring up Peter Orzag, Chief Executive Officer of Financial Advisory at Lazard.
Seating problem, maybe we'll just all be right here. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, and thank you to uh, Mark for getting us off to such a strong start. I also wanna uh, join others in commending Duke and Mark himself for uh, the success of the center. And it's great to be here. We have a star studded panel and a lot to talk about. Um, Liz, maybe we'll start with you, um, just given that you're the government official on the panel. Um, and let's talk about value-based care. I, I am a little bit worried that, uh, you know, the saying after all that has been said and done, more has been said than done, uh, applies to value-based care because it's sort of been the buzzword for a long time and progress seems painfully slow. So give us some hope. What is gonna happen under the Biden administration that's gonna make this all come to life much more forcefully than perhaps it, it has to date? Well, we have been really trying to rev up the engine and reignite that sort of sense of inevitability that we're moving in this direction. I will say I agree that it has been painfully slow. It does feel like we are in a marathon and not a sprint um, after 10 or 12 years. I think um, maybe we haven't made as much progress as we can or should, but I think there's still hope there. We believe very strongly that there is benefit for patients in moving in this direction. Now, Peter, hearkening back to your days in the administration when we worked together, I thought for sure you were gonna say we need to move in the direction of mandatory. Um, we're getting mandatory. to that. Okay, all right. <laughs> He's warming up. Okay, yeah. all right. Getting um, into it slowly. Well, I say, you know, one thing that we have been trying to do is send a, a very clear signal and direction for where we're going. Um, I think what we can do is um, with those sort of signals is when people know where the puck is going, they can help meet us there. And I think, um, so that's what we tried to do with the strategy that we put out uh, last October, um, that we really want everyone in Medicare and the vast majority of Medicaid beneficiaries to be um, in an accountable care arrangement. We wanna address health equity and we wanna do it together with um, other payers in the system. So clear direction, commitment, and sort of reigniting that enthusiasm is, is what we've been trying to do in the time that I've been on board. So for those who are kind of in the doubting camp, let's talk about some of the things where maybe the progress has been more painful. How should people interpret, for example, uh, the letting up on the gas pedal with regard to uh, the radiation oncology um, pilot and other measures where it seems like we're not necessarily moving as rapidly as some people had hoped? Well, I think we need to be smart about the direction we head. Um, and I think, again, that gets back to the clear signaling um, and I keep expecting you to talk about mandatory models. So radiation oncology was a good model. It is a good model. It brings us in the right direction. It was a mandatory model. Uh, we ended up with you know, legislation pushing back. I think we also end up with, um, you know, in some cases, litigation. Uh, for example, the most favored nation um, previous administration approach. So we wanna be smart in the direction we go. We wanna collaborate with stakeholders to make sure that where we're heading is um, in a direction where there's going to be support and and I believe um, I believe we can get there and I believe we can keep pushing and I believe we can put the foot back on the gas just in a different smarter way. So, oh, so one other question, question and I see Dan wants to get into which is great but just what else can we do to make fee for service less comfortable? It, it seems like it's you know there is a sort of tragedy of the commons here where everyone talks about trying to move forward but it is very difficult to make progress and it's just a little too easy to stay where we are, where there's such dispersed interests across different parts of the health system. So is there anything we can do? I, I, Mark had mentioned one idea about trying to um, widen the gap in 2025 and thereafter between uh, the MIPS, the different pathways that uh, exist and sort of uh, accentuate the incentive to jump over to the advanced payment models. Any ideas on what we can do to just try to shove the system a little bit more forcefully? I'm actually surprised that you're, you're being so pessimistic about what has happened in Medicare over the last 15, 20 years. I mean, it kind of takes me back to when I was running OMB Health and we had about 7% of Medicare beneficiaries in Medicare Advantage and now we're at 45 and it's a value-based payment model where you can't make money 
unless you have you know strong star ratings and the star ratings are all the things that we hope to accomplish maybe not all of them but we're kind of moving in that direction and so you know it's 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 funny like yes some of these models have not turned out the way that we wanted them to but i see pretty significant change in medicare over the last 15 20 years a lot of it due to what liz and others have been you know kind of slugging at over that time and it's serving as a precedent to things that we are now starting to drive into the uh, into the private sector. So I think maybe I'm a little less pessimistic, which is why. Okay, I'm, that's good. It's good know. not to be all depressed in a, that's in a okay. meeting like this. You're an economist. But, but, uh, but I would note, I mean, the thing that's fascinating about Medicare Advantage is, don't forget, and I still have the scars, for, and Liz remembers as well, from the ACA debate, where it was predicted that we were going to crush Medicare Advantage uh, and have uh, enrollment decline because of the uh, payment reductions. Right. And instead, it's, it's boom. So that was a... That was not an intentional policy change. It was a... Well, there's still a financial benefit for plans. For yeah, so let's talk insurance. about risk adjustment. Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, even, beyond, <laughs> even beyond risk adjustment, they're still getting paid more than traditional fee-for-service, so they have an advantage yeah. to traditional fee-for-service. I want to say from, you know, from my perspective, a, a couple thoughts. First is a big thank you to Mark and Duke. Um, they are terrific partners. You guys are having huge impact in D.C. and in the federal policy realm. We couldn't be doing the work we're doing without you. So a huge thank, thank you there. Um, the first thing I want to say is, you know, fundamentally from the perspective of people, of consumers, of families, of patients, um, the system's not working. And I think everybody in the audience knows it, period. We have a crisis right now. The number one reason that American families are in debt is because of medical care, despite the fact we're spending three or four times more than the rest of the world to give them that care, right? We also know that the care is far too complex. It's too fragmented and it's hard to access. Um, our outcomes far, in many cases are far uh, behind other nations, right? So we have a real problem. And I think this is fundamentally the tension between the policymakers. There is this very esoteric, deep, complex conversation happening on the policy level, but families are really suffering and feeling this. And uh, on the Hill and in the White House, they're trying to figure out how do we bridge that gap? The reality people are living with the work the policymakers are doing. And what we know for sure right now is in the last 10 years, what's basically happened is that under the rubric of payment to reform, we've seen a massive amount of power consolidating within payers and providers and prices going through the roof. And now we're in a situation where Medicare is maybe paying, uh, I mean, uh, private sector dance folks are paying three or four times more for the same services in Medicare. That's totally unsustainable. That means we don't get to retire when we want to, that means we don't get to live in the houses we want to. It means we can't send our kids to schools we want to. That's the reality we're operating under. And I think, Peter, you asked the question just right, which is, well, how do we disrupt this? How do we make it less comfortable? And I think part of that is acknowledging that we have an entire US healthcare sector, which is now a fifth of our economy, that is built on fee-for-service economics. Those economics make money by doing more and focusing on high margin procedures. That isn't good for people, period. Um, and, and so one of the things we have to do is make it uncomfortable. And obviously creating a delta between what you can make under traditional fee-for-service and APMs is a really, really important way to do that. Um, we've been recommending it. I've been part of different efforts um, recommending that for the last 12 years. Um, but there's something else. And I would say, and what we really have to think about is disruption. How do we disrupt the, the current business case in healthcare? Um, to align interest with what we need as people. And one of the things I think that is, is often not discussed enough is unveiling the conflict, unveiling the ways in which the system is failing people. Um, and that has to start with data and operability and making data available for people to report on the poor outcomes, the high cost. I mean, do you, how many of you know whether or not the hospital that's in your community has raised their prices by 200% in the last two years? Many of you live in those communities, but you don't know it, right? That's an, that's an example of the kind of disruption. People need to get outraged about what's happening behind the curtain. Um, and that isn't happening. So that, that would be another place to go. Right, so let's talk about disruption in a second. But I, again, just to maybe balance the discussion, I'm kind of curious. Um, do you all, behind your, uh, uh, some of your comments was a concern that in, in some sense, we have not, not only not made progress, but maybe things have actually gotten worse. And so let me just ask the question, in terms of the trade-off between cost and quality in the US healthcare system, is it better today? Let me ask all three of you, better today or better 15 years ago? Has it gotten worse, better, or stayed the same? 
Well, from a coverage perspective, there's a lot more people with coverage thanks to the Affordable Care Act. I think we've seen, um, what, 20 million more people with coverage. Whether that translates to access and whether it translates to affordability is, I think, another question. And better health, I think, is another question. Um, I think we are better off in many respects. I have to say, after taking a a break from the sort of um, public government role, coming back, there's a lot of new players and a lot of consolidation that's happened and just still trying to understand the landscape of what's changed and whether it's better or whether it's not better, I think is is a complicated question. I don't think there's an obvious answer. Um, I, I would say that you can point to bright spots where things are better, um, but they're they're very, they're sort of surgically in there. And you know, for example, our readmission rates are down and things like that. However, ultimately, I think that we have to acknowledge the notion that um, we are spending far too much on healthcare. Um, The delta between public payers and private payers has grown very, very wide. That's incredibly dangerous, both for access for people who rely on Medicare or Medicaid, as well as for employees who are trying to um, bear the burden of of that cost shift. So I think that um, in that way, things are much worse. But I also wanna say this, this isn't about a trade-off between cost and quality, it isn't. Fee-for-service economics um, you know, for those of us who've sat in the seats where, from the federal perspective, you work in the Senate or wherever, and you have the sector come in and lobby you, or I used to work with governors, and they come in and lobby governors or state capitals, right? Um, there's always just, and the message is very clear. One, all we want to do is take care of our patients. Two, you got to pay us more, and you got to get out of our way. That's the constant drumbeat. Now, when you get behind the curtain, what you find out is, um, despite whether or not they want to do what's best for their patients, they are responding to fee-for-service economics. Those economics say, do more of what makes us money, do less of what makes us less money. That is not good for us, for patients. What's good for us? More primary care, more behavioral health, more access to, to care that addresses social determinants of health. That's what we know is actually going ch- to, to move the needle. And so this isn't a question of, can we spend less um, without sacrificing quality, it's how do we spend less and actually get better quality and better outcomes? And I think that's where we are at, at families, trying to, tr- trying to thread that needle. And I'd say, um, so agreeing that there are some elements that are better and some elements that are worse uh, relative to 20 years ago, I, I want to just say how congruent I am with how Fred is thinking about the diagnosis of the problem uh, with respect to high expense, lack of sensitivity to outcome, problems with the fee-for-service model. And the question you know, that we're grappling with at Morgan Health right now is how do you motivate action in the employer sector? And look, you know, a lot of the issues uh, with social determinants of health, food insecurity, um, poor outcomes, uh, the lack of strong providers in certain neighborhoods um, are, as prevalent in the employer markets as they are in Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, And I think we often forget that, but the literature shows it really clearly. And so, you know, we kind of start from the fact that you have people working in Fortune 100 companies right now who can't put food on the table and are suffering, you know, health issues as a result of that. And so, you know, the, the question then becomes, and I think kind of core to your question about mandatory models or, kind of how do you get more change faster, which we all want. Um, you know, one of the things that, that I find very heartening is that you do see models that are based on Medicare and Medicaid starting to come into the private sector. Uh, you see a lot of innovative companies, companies like Vera that we invested in, um, that we are, where we're working very hard to accelerate their progress. Um, companies like Eden, Firefly, Centivo, you know, these companies are basically coming in and saying, we have to disrupt the current model because we cannot be complacent with the status quo. And our strategy is go in, find these companies, find good companies, fund them, expedite their progress and move them along. Because, you know, again, 150 million people in the commercial sector and employer-sponsored insurance, where is the federal uh, policy agenda around ESI? It does not exist because we focus on Medicare and Medicaid because that's where the levers are. But yet, you know, you have the same level of dysfunction. And as Fred points out, perhaps even more because when, when Medicare ratchets back on payments to hospitals, guess who's picking up the tab? I mean, that's why we're in the situation that we're in right now with respect to 
pricing differentials. So Dan, let me, let me kind of press on this a little bit because employers clearly, if we're going to actually do anything, they have yes. to be a much more forceful uh, part of the equation to, to get yeah. us there. So tell us a little bit now that you've spent a lot more time uh, kind of hand in hand with an HR department actually making decisions. What's different in that world than this kind of you know, policy oriented world? And also just to be blunt and put you on the spot a little bit, what lessons can you learn from the perhaps overhyped uh, hope for yeah. your predecessor uh, organization that didn't really kind of uh, result in much. Who's that? Yeah. <laughs> so, so you know, what what lessons can we learn from that too? What fundamentally, yeah. what is the problem here, and why can't we get more action out of employees? Uh, Peter, how much time do you have? First, first, I want to say we have a great relationship with the J.P. Morgan Chase Benefits Department, and they are our partners. And so, you know, with that said. I think that I look at the landscape of benefit departments, um, you know, kind of throughout the Fortune 100 companies, um, and they are not motivated by the same things that we are talking about up here. They, 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 they will get their bonus if people don't complain, and if benefits are stable, and if there's kind of a stable structure. As a, they're they're not, you know, going to get their bonus if they improve population health outcomes, make sure that you know there's more. Um, uh, you know, cancer screenings going on and, and uh, better cholesterol and, and better, um, you know, A1Cs for diabetic patients. So, you know, the way that we are measured at Morgan Health is we have kind of, a, we have a double bottom line. And one part of our bottom line is health improvement for our employees and availability of um, accountable care and other models uh, in the private sector. And then the other part is that we're making investments off of the balance sheet of the company so we have to make sure that we're good stewards. Of How are you health. measuring health improvement for your employees? Um, it's standard measures. So it's A1Cs and diet and uh, and cholesterol and cancer screenings, and then we have a bunch of process measures. I mean, it really looks a lot. We we really try to pattern it much after the the kinds of of things that you see in the um, in the star ratings. But I would say that that this disparity between the motivation for benefits departments really being kind of more risk averse and avoiding complaints versus what we want to accomplish is something that we'd love to, to address. Um, and I think it's really kind of in some ways at the root of the problem. But our strategy, you know, I, I mentioned that we are investing in companies that are innovative and we're bringing them into our environment. And that's kind of one aspect of the strategy. Um, a second is to raise the level of how we do benefits in terms of, you know, those those measures. And then the third is really around thought leadership, where we're working with the wonderful people at Duke and others, you know, to kind of advance a focus to really encourage uh, employers to raise the bar and have higher expectations and not be complacent with the fee for service model. So why don't we come back for a second to Medicare Advantage, just because uh, that is, you know, one area of uh, dynamism, at least. Um, and maybe Liz, this is a question for you, which is uh, as Medicare Advantage enrollment continues to grow, which has been the case for the past decade, um, the whole way in which we price Medicare Advantage is still, you know, has not evolved. And at some point soon, and it's already the case in many, in, in many local areas, we are pricing, you know, the dog off the tail. Exactly. Um, and so how's that going to play? What is the future there? Yeah, you, that analogy is what we talk about behind the scenes as well, the tail wagging the dog, um, especially in regions or areas where, or markets where um, Medicare Advantage is a huge um, majority of the population enrolled. I think we need to revisit um, the payment scheme. I think uh, this is, there, there's not that much that CMS can do on its own. We really need legislation and smart and thoughtful legislation. And I think First of all, and going back to the sort of strategy that we have laid out, we're not assuming that Medicare Advantage is offering accountable care to everyone. They may still be paying fee for service um, and not changing the landscape. So we're not gonna assume that it's, it's all better just because you're in a capitated plan. We'd like to see those better outcomes and, and better patient, um, um, patient health coming out of, of Medicare Advantage. In many cases, that might be the case, not in all cases. Um, in terms of the payment methods, we're, I think that's why the what we're trying to do in, in our ACO models and what we're trying to do in Medicare shared savings 
that is the only place in fee for service where there might be the chance for a level playing field, um, where there might be a chance for additional benefits. I mean, why do people go into Medicare Advantage? There's extra benefits, there's lower premiums. Um, they can, you know, use the, the savings that they've generated and reinvest them. We want to look to do the same sort of thing in um, our ACO models, like ACO reach, where there are the chances of giving extra benefits for patients. Uh, we have an ACO um, offering um, dental benefits. We have an ACO that's looking at, um, um, you know, food as medicine and, and helping with nutrition and some of the social needs. That's the sort of innovation we want to see on the traditional fee-for-service side. And the only way we're going to see that, I think, is in these ACO models, which is why we're saying that everybody needs to be in one of these models and there should be a level playing field and Congress should come in and- You know, I find this, I find this really interesting though, because like, what is the tail and what is the dog? Mm -hmm. And when, again, 20 years ago, when it was 7% Medicare Advantage, now we're at 45, we're growing by 8% a year. In, in some markets, there are more, you know, in fact, in most urban markets right now, I think it's fair to say that there's more people in Medicare Advantage than there is. Medicare Advantage is the dog and fee-for-service is the tail. And everything that we wanted, or the, I would say everything that the Congress wanted in an accountable model, and it's full risk accountable care with quality metrics is in Medicare Advantage. So I think it's just gonna to continue to grow. It's gonna become the dominant portion of the Medicare system. Uh, and then it's, then the question is, what do we want it to be and controlling it in a way that makes more sense than what we have now? Right? Well, you know, it, what's interesting about this too is there's a similar dynamic in Medicaid where we've seen more and more patients move from uh, a traditional Medicaid approach to a, a Medicaid managed care plan. Um, and we have a real problem here, which is, first of all, as Liz was saying, uh, any panel you're wrong with Medicare Advantage, what they say is we're capitated, so we are payment reform. And what we know is underneath that, we've got nothing but fee-for-service in most instances, one. Two, then there, there's this touting of all the benefits to, bene to, to folks who enrolled in, in Medicare Advantage. Um, and it's, uh, but what we know is they're getting about 103% off the top of traditional fee-for-service. They're using that to advertise these extra benefits. And that's why people are enrolling in MA because it's like, I can get eyeglasses. I can get dental, a very limited dental benefit, right? I don't have to pay that extra, um, the, my, my gap uh, premium, et cetera, et cetera. It isn't for the reasons that they're saying, right? Um, but I remember when I was working with governors on the Medicaid side on reforming, uh, payment reform on Medicaid, not one, not two, but several Medicaid Advantage plans came to me and said, I want to tell you honestly what's going on. We get a percentage of the pie. That is how we get paid. And if our business strategy is to make that pie shrink year over year or the growth rate shrink year over year, that's a terrible business strategy. We're not interested in doing that. And I honestly believe if you look at what's happened with your TPAs on employer-sponsored coverage, it's unforgivable. You have an intermediary that's supposed to be creating your networks, and negotiating your prices, and they're negotiating you into 304% of Medicare. That's nuts, right? So we do have a problem where the business model of the payers is also distorted and not in the interests of all of us who are just trying to be healthy and not go bankrupt doing it, right? So maybe it would be unfair to ask Liz because I think it would put her in a bad position, but let me ask the other two of you. <laughs> so let's hypothetically say that in November, uh, at least one of the houses, if not both, flip Republican. Um, is this an area where you might see some legislative activity to kind of uh, dial back? No, not dial back necessarily, but um, again, because Medicare Advantage was not fundamentally designed at the get-go to be the majority of uh, Medicare coverage, there are changes that presumably you'd want to do. Is this something that you might see a uh, Biden administration, you can cover your ears, uh, reach some kind of deal with Republicans on in an otherwise barren legislative landscape? I'm going to give the bear case. Are you going to give the bull case? What? I can give both, yeah. Okay. You're going to give both? Yeah. Both cases? Oh, come on. Yeah. Both, well, here's Let's what I would say. choose one, Brett. Yeah. Well, here's, here's what I would say. First of all, <laughs> on the one we got to be really clear about something. We know, uh, and Family Jersey takes this very seriously. Health is not a partisan issue. Everybody wants this. Everybody wants to spend less money and be able to live a healthy life, period. And for us, this is not about Democrats versus Republicans, period, okay? Um, but we do know when Republicans had the, both chambers and the White House, they put forward a plan. And their plan is very, very easy to understand, which is healthcare costs are out of control. We're done. We are gonna offload risk to the states and to people. They need to figure this out. That was repeal 
repeal. There was never really a replacement repeal, right? That is their plan. That is Republican leadership's plan. I think that when they are, if they are in control again, you're going to see more of that. However, there is a really deep political need that has to be met, which is this is always a number two or three issue for American voters. And they vote on healthcare. They really do. So there is an instinct on the Hill. We need to do something. And we need to be able to respond as political pressure. And we at Families and other folks like us have very good relationships with Republican offices, not necessarily leadership, because I think leadership's approach is very blunt, but there are many members who are very conservative. And I'll tell you what gets them madder than anything is, this is not competition. If it's drug prices where, you know, pharma is taking their government granted monopoly to set a price and then see how, you know, how far can they go? Right. Right. I'm going to give a very different answer to this question. Okay. Okay. Or if it's if it's hospitals that are just abusing their market power to, to negotiate an out of control price, yeah. people get upset about that. And I do think, for example, our no surprises legislation that we passed a couple of years ago to finally outlaw the practice right. of surprise medical bills, uh, mostly in most instances, um, to try to create more data transparency. That was utterly bipartisan. That came out of the help committee with both sides of the aisle engaged. I think these kinds of fairness fights um, that are less uh, pointed, we can make some real progress on. And now for a different view. So agreeing, <laughs> yeah. so agreeing completely with the premise of the importance of the issue, um, I'm very pessimistic that there's going to be any fundamental legislation uh, in this area. And frankly, this is one of the reasons why I'm working in the private sector right now to try to address some of these issues, because we can't afford to wait. You know, and and I'd say that you know, look on on Medicare Advantage, there are a lot of puts and takes here. Um, I actually believe that it is a concerted strategy to grow Medicare Advantage. Uh, so it isn't just some accident or something that happened. I think that, that that is really where the more fundamental reform of the system has been coming from. It is where it will continue to come from. And then it's incumbent on, on the Congress ultimately to make kind of changes around the edges to, because changes around the edges definitely can happen in concert with CMS you know, to kind of bring things a little bit more into line over time. Um, but, you know, I think that, that with respect to some of these more fundamental problems, and in particular, introducing some of these accountable care models into the private sector, that that needs to, the push needs to come from employers. I agree. It's just not, not going to happen, uh, you know, from the Congress. And it's not like, there, you know, someone's going to wake up and say, here's the agenda in employer-sponsored insurance. It's ERISA. It's like, you know, Try to crack that nut, forget about it. Well, I'm not gonna answer your question on what's the Biden administration gonna go right. do <laughs> under a Republican Congress, but I will say there's probably more agreement out there than maybe we realize if we focus on the issues that really need to be fixed. I mean, look at macro was bipartisan. There are pockets of opportunities um, where like, like Frederick said, if it's un, a matter of competition, fairness, prices, and, and people are bringing forward um, real problems and there's a solution to them, I think you can get bipartisan support. So I don't want to be a pessimist on, on that front. Whether they fix Medicare Advantage, I think is an entirely different question. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about, let's pick up uh, something from the previous panel and the, the hope of uh, at-home diagnostics and, and sort of care to the home. And let's just start on the at-home diagnostics. This has a potential to be coming back to health equity, a massive kind of leveling uh, force to yeah. reduce the, the cost and improve the access to high quality testing, but it could also go the other way. I don't know. I mean, I travel around with my little Q test and you know, people have Vucera tests uh, stockpiled in their, in their uh, closets. I don't know that that is you know, the norm. So how do you see A, this uh, technological uh, shift uh, affecting, let's start with the employer-sponsored world, um, and B, is it going to be a leveler or is it going to result in even more uh, health gradient and health inequality? We're really interested in this area because, so if you start with accountable care models, and I named a few companies um, that, that you know, we think are promising, because what you want to do is enable employers to tap into meaningful accountable care easily. You know, because most employers don't spend all their time worrying about healthcare, they have to have an option that's on the table that's kind of readily available. And so if you think about Vera, Firefly, Eden, Centivo, other companies in that space, um, that's kind of one level of it. And then kind of the, the second element of our strategy is to invest in tools and technologies that enable accountable care. 
So that might be care navigation. It might be um, kind of integrated technology that, that enables at-home visits. And lab is, is a great area because um, the fact is if, if the employer, the empl employers today pay a lot for lab services because there is an effective monopoly on those services, just to be blunt about it. And to have disruption come in and say, all right, you know, you can do an at-home test paired with a nurse visit for these kind of routine interactions. If we can capture a volume reduction associated with that um, and build that into an accountable model where there's kind of cost quality um, accountability, that's very positive. And so we've run the economics on that and we're ready to invest in companies that do bring those, those tools into the home. So what Scott was talking about, um, I am a complete believer that if it's structured properly, that it can reduce cost. Now, if you try to introduce this into the federal context, right. I have no confidence that it would save any money. But yet, if we're operating in the context of full risk accountable care, I'll, I'll have it any day. I guess that would be the point I would make is that's why total cost of care and this sort of accountable model is so important. Otherwise you do have the volume and the, and the trajectory where it's just an incentive to do more and pay for more. And um, whether it's necessary or not, whether it's um, leads to better outcomes or not, that's why you really need to think about it in this sort of, we wanna see the better outcomes, but we want also this responsibility for um, total cost of care. I, that's exactly what I was going with Liz. Like, Dan, the vision that you're painting is a beautiful vision. <laughs> and I am not there one bit because we learned this lesson the last 10 years. We put out these models. We're going to, you know, we're going to, we're going to align you as a health system. We'll make money because you're doing what's right for patients. You know, and the stories on those pioneer ACOs, the nurse CEO who's like, people are stopping when I walk in the hospital. And like, this is why I practice medicine. I finally get to have care teams and care for my patients. Like that is all real. But let's not get confused. Our healthcare system almost exclusively is driven by fee-for-service economics. As long as that's the case, Dan's vision is not going to come true. We know what's going to happen, which is, and by the way, I years ago when I was working with one of the leading consultants to the healthcare sector, sat in rooms where people were planning for telemedicine, right? Which was a giant stadium-like room with nothing but TV screens and three providers who are just doing telemedicine visits nonstop, right? That is what fee-for-service unleashed upon a new way of receiving care looks like. So I think we got to ask ourselves, what are the economic incentives underneath this, the reforms in home mm -hmm. testing and home care that are going to drive behavior and not expect the sector to do what's right when it's not in their economic. So I'll tell you, economic, economic incentive, we pay about $2 billion a year for healthcare for our employees and dependents in the US, okay? And I know what we pay for lab services. And I also know, by the way, what we pay even for wellness, kind of there's an annual wellness check. I know what we pay there. And I know that our employees have to actually travel in to a physical site location. And what we pay is too much. And we could be doing that from the home we could probably be better, get, getting better compliance with our annual wellness check, which we like because it ends up producing oh, our your cost. Your compliance is going to go up. So your compliance is going to go up. So I think sure. that I think that not necessarily if we co-own the asset. And so you know what I would say is that that there are ways employers have to get a handle on their costs and cannot succumb to this idea that it's just going to continue to go up and up. I really believe that that if you have these tools, virtual visits. A substitution of at-home care, uh, the introduction of full risk accountability models into places where employers have concentrated geographic positions, that employers have the power to actually improve matters. Well, I just want to say, to, so I just want to, there's one point Liz was making that is so important. I just want to underscore it, which is um, the thing that's most troubling lately for us at Families is that there's been such a misunderstanding about what these APMs are and what we're trying to do. And I just want to underscore here, it's about aligning financial incentives of the sector with people. That is what they are about. And they're, they're the missing ingredient. You use that line. That's good. That's yeah. Good. Well, and I, and I think that Liz, is, Liz and Seema Mai is under assault because there's such a misunderstanding. We only exist at families to ensure that the best health and health care are equally accessible and affordable to all in our nation. That's what we're working for every day. And we are 100% bought in that we've got to understand that we either get financial alignment between providers and patients, or we're gonna end up with greater health disparities, greater inequities. This is, this is one of the missing ingredients that we have to invest in. So just to, just to ask, because this is, you know, the, the retort that you get is, 
all that value-based care models are doing is they're changing, uh, in, in some sense, the gatekeeper from the insurance company that denies coverage to the provider who's at risk to say no. Uh, and so what actually, I mean, how do you answer that question that all you're doing is moving the gatekeeper from one place to another, and you're not necessarily actually really aligning incentives with the individual, you're just kind of, you know, well, Put, first, putting the dirt under a different part of the uh, the carpet. Well, first of all, you're making you kind of make my point, Peter, which is, and I want everyone to like, especially if any of you have had people who are, who are at end of life. I think that's where you really see this the most profoundly. When the provider saying, "Let's not do that," that can be a huge win. That can be a huge win. The amount of very expensive drugs that we're pumping into people, the amount of pain and the amount of suffering that we're seeing because of fee-for-service economics on people is real. And so the question isn't, why can't we do more? The question is, what should we be doing to give you the best quality of life possible and give you the best health possible? So that, that no is not always a bad thing and it's not always not in the interest of the patients. But the difference here, and I think this is fundamentally where there's been such a misunderstanding is that the sector comes in to the Senate, to the House, to the White House, to the governors and says, Hi there, it's us again. We just want to do what's right for patients. Get out of our way and pay us more, right? That's their never-ending message. And underneath it, they say, and look at all this stuff we're doing for value. And the stuff we're doing is things like, we're doing a bundle. We're now doing a bundle. Isn't that great? We're saving Medicare money. But by the way, the billboards went up in our, in, in our town. And now we're trying to get as many new replacements as we can, right? We're dialing up volume somewhere else. And so I think fundamentally, we have to start asking ourselves, this provider or this group of providers, where are their financial interests? Are they really aligned? And early research we did about 12 years ago said they are not really aligned until at least 60% of their book of business is in full or near full risk. That's, we don't, you don't have alignment until then. No one is there yet. And the only way we get there is when Liz's folks are working really hard to get Medicare and Medicaid aligned, Dan's folks are working really, really hard to get ESI, employer-sponsored coverage aligned, and we create a real economic unit. Until that moment, all of this is basically just window dressing for how do I dial up volume and price in my, in my opinion. So I, I will give a practical answer to your, so you, you asked the question, what's the difference between the payer holding the risk and the provider holding the risk? Um, and I think that there are meaningful differences between those two settings, and some of them come out of the Medicare literature that shows that the provider focused models are generally the ones that are more successful. Um, and in the context of, of our employees and dependents, we know that they have a greater level of trust working with providers and that's what they want. Um, and I think that, that in the context of alignment of incentives, something that, that Frederick is very passionate about, that we get better alignment when the patient has you know, an interaction with the, with the, with the um, uh, primary care practice. Uh, and is able to engage in that way. Um, so we, we are in, in process of giving that as an option for our employees. And I think that the other thing that, that, um, that helps us is data. You know, so right now we have no idea. In the fee-for-service world, you don't get the right data. You don't get good data about outcomes and what is actually happening. In the integrated world, it has to be set up with, with strong data systems because that's how you're paying your providers. So you have a lever uh, that says that, you know, we want the following outcomes and this is the upside and downside risk that you're going to be assuming. So I, I, I have a lot more confidence that we will get the outcomes that we want because we will ultimately be paying for them directly. Right, so, so I we, think sorry, there's ahead, two common themes. Okay. I'm just going to jump in here. Yeah, because, <laughs> anyways, uh, There's two common themes here. Um, first of all, is that we all need to be on the same page and there's a lot of alignment on the direction to go. Patients, employers, payers, government, um, that really we need to move in the same direction, but we, we really need to do this together. Um, you were saying it 60% it needs to be um, at risk or, or uh, at full, full risk um, before you start to make progress. It feels like um, if there's this much alignment, that's this whole notion of getting everyone on the same page, this multi-payer alignment is really key to making progress. So that's something we can work on. And the second thing, and, and Peter, you alluded to this, is just um, this perception of stinting or this perception that there's, you know, pr now providers have an incentive not to provide care. I think that's, I think that's a little bit misplaced. I don't think that's where providers start. I think that's what the uh, incentive system provides under fee-for-service, but I think we all need to do a better job explaining uh, what it is we want out of the system and, and how to get there. 
And I think what the direct contracting model showed us was um, it's really easy to villainize uh, some of these approaches uh, and, and mischaracterize um, what we're trying to achieve and the direction we're trying to go. And so um, I think if there's a second theme, it's, it's just we need to do a better job in terms of how we describe what we're trying to achieve. And we all need to be maybe singing from the same songbook in terms of some of the messaging. We're about to release some, by the way. Oh, good. Yeah. So let me ask you about disruption, because that, that, that's kind of a key part here. It's very hard to disrupt existing organizations. They tend to move very sclerotically, and it's you know, just a, a very challenging thing. So what about this idea that we're not really going to change, including primary care, uh, without new entrants, whether it be Amazon or Walmart or some new shape, new entrant, can we get from here to there without someone doing something dramatic? I think that's the role of the CMS Innovation Center, to be quite frank with you. I think we need to do two things. I think we need to create that space for innovators and disruptors. And, and, and where, where do they need to go if um, you know, those rules get in their way, but they're looking to improve care for the right reasons, we need to create that space. But we also have to find a way to bring in those new entrants and um, those who haven't been part of value-based care. So yeah. I see that as fundamentally the role of, of the CMS Innovation Center. And it's, it's so important because we have to also acknowledge that a lot of the distortions in the healthcare sector are because of government regulation and laws that restrict the ability of people to enter. And so if we don't have a really smart group of folks in CMMI working to kind of block and tackle those things to allow the new entrants to come and disrupt, we have a real problem. And I'll give you an example. Uh, when I was working at National Governors and we were working on some telemedicine and trying to get access in rural America for folks who, you know, had to drive four hours to get to their nearest provider. I mean, these people really, really need access. My phone rang um, for a few days. It rang off the hook and it was nothing but the health policy advisors of rural states calling me to say that they were get, hearing from their medical societies about this interstate scope of practice issues, mm -hmm. right? Like that's just one tiny example of the kinds of obstacles that get thrown up against innovators because the sector's using government regulation and laws to block new entrants from coming in and really disrupting them. So, so I'm gonna agree with what Liz said about innovation coming out of CMMI. We've really benefited from the work of CMMI. And it's critically important that, you know, everyone in this room support uh, what Liz is doing. And it's not, it's not a picnic <laughs> over there. Nope. And um, she needs our support. So that's kind of point one. Um, point two is that we also need centers for studying innovation in the private sector. Um, that is what we have created at JP Morgan Chase. Um, we are uh, completely committed to publicizing the results of what we are doing, good, bad, and ugly. And that's something that, you know, we're committed to. And there are, have been many other employers, and, you know, I, I think about Walmart and Boeing and others who've done really important and interesting work. Um, again, being candid about what is working and what is not. So we need kind of more innovation centers, if you will, um, not only within CMMI, but also out in the private sector. That's kind of a second point. And then I think the third thing is that, um, that I see much more innovation coming from the middle market than from those big companies that you uh, described. Um, so these are companies that you know, have gone through an A round, a B round, or a C round of funding uh, and are just kind of pushing to get to that next stage. And they are disruptive and they come in. And again, every company has to have a relationship with the existing systems. But you know, look, I look at, our partner in Columbus, Ohio, where we have about 40,000 employees and dependents is Central Ohio Primary Care. It's a great primary care practice. It is a primary care practice that learned how to do risk from Medicare. And now they're coming in and structuring full risk cap with us. And for the employer sector, the only reason why we're able to engage with them is because of the work that CMMI did with them. And so it's kind of a, to me, there's, there's a real, um, uh, you know, kind of, you see the innovation essentially coming from the middle market as opposed to the larger companies. All right, well, I have two announcements. Uh, the first is in the great sock debate of Scott Gottlieb versus Frederick. <laughs> I'm going with Frederick, I think they're way cooler. Uh -huh. And secondly, uh, thank you to the panel. We are going to take a short break and we're gonna reconvene at 3 p.m. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>
2016, Duke University launched a new interdisciplinary initiative to advance health policy. This effort became a reality because of the generous support of Duke alumnus Robert Margolis and his wife Lisa, who founded the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy. The Duke Margolis Center has been transformational to Duke. Our goal is to improve health outcomes and health equity across the nation. The Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy is an interdisciplinary research and education program university-wide at Duke intended to help improve health, health care, and health equity for people locally around the country and around the world through better evidence-based approaches to designing and implementing health care policies. One of the great strengths of being at a university like Duke is that we have access to extraordinary leaders, uh, leaders in our academic enterprise, in our health system, and importantly, in the Duke Margolis Center. This has been an extraordinary partnership on so many levels. Health policy is about influencing what people care about most when it comes to their health and the health of their loved ones. It's helping them get access to the latest and best technologies for their needs. It's helping them do so in a way that's convenient and accessible, and it's helping them do so in a way that's affordable and sustainable. At the end of the day, it's a very personal problem. I think that there's so much more that we can do to make the, the cycle of biomedical production and approvals and payment more efficient, more diverse, and more meaningful to the patients that it needs to serve. But we're really limited a lot of times by the data that are available. And that means that oftentimes policymaking isn't evidence-based. Um, and that has been a place where the Moore Gold Center has focused and where we need to do more work to be able to understand you know, what is happening for these really important populations, huge percentages of Americans. So as a mom and a nurse, and a foster parent in our community here. I've seen how health policy can both affect and improve the lives of these vulnerable populations. The work at Duke Margolis is aimed at the broader world. It's aimed at having an actual impact on health policy, the way people get their health care, and what we can do to help them improve their health. We have demonstrated that we can be exemplars in convening policy makers and providers and industry leaders and other thought leaders in coming together to tackle critical issues in health and in health care in order to come up with the right and most impactful policy decisions. The Duke Margolis Center first is a, a support for interdisciplinary scholarship to help us think deeply about health policy. It's a way that we can have direct engagement with policymakers. And, and steer the course of healthcare in this country. I think what's really unique about the Margola Center is that it spans the whole university and it really provides uh, an avenue for interdisciplinary collaboration to address all of the most pressing uh, issues in health and health policy. I am a health economist and I work on applied empirical research related to the healthcare system. The Margolis Center can help me make those, uh, make my research more relevant to policy and also um, provide a vehicle to convey the results of that research to policymakers. What will stick with me would be the need to approach any solution in healthcare or otherwise from a very multidisciplinary lens. I think one important aspect of, it, of the Margolis Center is that it's educating the next generation of leaders uh, in health policy. And so the students who flock to Margolis to get these experiences, um, they're going to be the people who are setting the agenda uh, in the future. So our first scholar was Madhu Valmiri, who was a, a Master's of Public Policy student, and she, um, I think, is a, is a great success story to point to. I'm really proud to have been the first Duke Margolis scholar um, and grateful for the opportunities that it's afforded me, um, the exposure that I got to a vast array of important health policy topics, 
um, the doors it opened for me in terms of getting to really meet um, incredible leaders in health policy across the state and across the country, and for how it really helped um, help me find my purpose in, in choosing public service as the way that I wanted to make an impact in health policy. I would say there's also an explosion of controversy in health policy now, and it's important to have trusted institutions that um, can not only um, develop uh, high quality, rigorous, and transparent research, but can also communicate the results of, of that research to uh, policymakers, consumers, the general public. So I think the role of, um, of the Margolis Center as a trusted institution is probably even more important today than it's ever been. This is really an exciting time in health policy. There's a lot of, there's a lot of problems within health and health care um, and health equity that, that need need solutions and need policy solutions and it's been really inspiring to, to see the interest of students and to, to try to meet that need. In the future, I will be doing a job that has not been created yet. Duke Margolis has done a really great job of preparing us scholars for that type of innovation and for that type of fast moving environment. Duke Margolis has already established itself as a go-to entity for us as a university, for anyone thinking about the transformation in healthcare in the coming years. Uh, our goal over the next five to ten years is to build on this base of expertise, build on this base of reputation, and be the leaders who can help us think deeply about how our healthcare system can be uh, the best in the world, how we can improve equitable outcomes for everyone in our country and indeed throughout the world. We have more momentum uh, and more collaborators than ever and more opportunities than ever to build on these successes and achieve a much healthier, uh, a much more innovative and a much more affordable healthcare system for the future. Be assured the best is yet to come. Let's go Duke! Please welcome back to the stage, Dr. Mark McClellan. Welcome back. Thanks again for thanks again for being with us today. Um, we still got half of our program to go. I know it's so nice to have an opportunity to to network in person, and I appreciate everybody spacing out some while they're doing that. Um, I, I'm also very much looking forward to this next segment of our program, uh, now focusing on strengthening FDA and CMS for the future. And as you know, there have been some issues in the news involving uh, FDA and CMS recently. So um, let's get going right away. First, I'd like to introduce uh, Janet Woodcock, who uh, uh, neither of these people really need introductions, but Janet is now the Principal Deputy Commissioner of uh, Food and Drugs for the FDA. And also would like to introduce Dr. Lee Fleischer, who's Chief Medical Officer and the Director of the Center for Clinical Standards and Quality uh, at CMS. Janet Lee, thanks so much for, for being with us. And I'd like to get right into uh, our, our focus on uh, opportunities for um, FDA and CMS to, to work together and how that's playing out. I think everybody here appreciates the importance of FDA and CMS for the process of developing and providing access and then encouraging appropriate use of medical technologies. And, and the, the number, the diversity, the scope, the potential of these medical technologies keeps getting uh, more and more complex. Uh, that's good news in a sense that more and more opportunities to, in, to improve the health of the public, as we've been talking about already today in the context of COVID and elsewhere, um, but challenging in the sense of uh, how can we best develop the, the needed evidence to support uh, their effective use and make these processes go as smoothly as possible? Along with that, we're seeing lots of new opportunities for developing real-world evidence, learning more about products once they're on the market, maybe doing clinical trials in innovative ways. So um, what may be less appreciated is that FDA and CMS do have some uh, history of collaboration on these kinds of evidence issues and improving the, the development and, and, and use process. Uh, maybe some of the, the best examples of these, um, Lee, involve um, major medical devices and 
And occasionally these involve national coverage decisions where that early contact can contact and, and, and collaboration can help. So maybe Lee, if, if you don't mind starting, uh, can you talk a little bit about how early interaction involving FDA and CMS and other stakeholders has worked well in, uh, in the past or has had some notable uh, impacts, for example, around minimally invasive uh, valve procedures. Absolutely, and thank you, Mark. And it's really a pleasure to be here today with Janet and, and share the stage. And you know, it's, it's sort of funny, as an anesthesiologist, I've actually watched this in the field. And when I, I practiced, which I did last Friday, you could see the difference. It's really about Tavar and the idea of breakthrough and how getting it to earlier to market, but really do it, switching the evidence development, particularly at the expansion of the label to the post-marketing uh, phase, post-approval, or well, you always correct me. And I say that only appropriately with <laughs> devices are- Well, they're cleared or approved, cleared. so yes. feel free. <laughs> so after the device is cleared and you know, what's been exciting is our team engages quite early um, on the device side with both the manufacturer and the device side of the FDA. And when the device came out, it was covered with evidence development and what was exciting to both watch in the field, but also hear about from the CMS, the inside story is, you know, it was always, Tavar in particular was around high risk individuals. And as it needed to be expanded, they worked together as the IND and as the label changed it really was sort of joint work where the protocols were designed to actually fulfill an FDA requirement and a CMS requirement of our statutory authority about reasonable and necessary for the treatment of an illness. And I think that that's an example where the public, our beneficiaries in particular, really uh, received better care to now, it's the standard of care. Yeah. And Janet, any um, anything you'd like to add on this, other examples? And, and this kind of collaboration happens outside of national coverage decisions. In fact, mainly, I think, outside of that context. Sure, well, I think the um, <coughs> transcatheter uh, valve replacement example is a really good one because it was a win-win. It was a win for patients, for the FDA, for, the, uh, uh, for coverage, but also for the manufacturers because they got uh, out of this registry, they got expanded indications without having to do additional clinical trials. And so it was kind of the best of all possible worlds as far as evidence generation post-market. Um, <clears throat> not all circumstances are gonna be like that, but yeah, we've had coverage with evidence development of various things where additional knowledge is gained. We've had um, you know, registries and other things. It really requires, like the uh, transcatheter example required the American College of Cardiology and it required the healthcare professionals as well as the manufacturers and the FDA and everybody to get together and plan this in advance. And I think that's why it was so fruitful. It also, I think, requires us to spot those issues and examples where this would be good, a, a good path forward, whether it be a registry, uh, use of the Medicare claims data, which we do, which we do quite a bit uh, uh, on, on safety. And safety so, issues or, or uh, maybe post-market vaccine issues, things like that. Yeah, well, you know, I think real world evidence is becoming more and more useful. For example, just seen some um, evidence on the use of monoclonal antibodies um, for COVID that was very uh, compelling. And it had a, a same characteristic. It was planned in advance. So uh, requiring a registry or something so that certain data elements are collected is really important here. Uh, what we typically have to do is go back and reconstruct getting the claims data and searching through the charts and everything. And that uh, the real world evidence works best when you say we need to gather more information and here's how we're gonna do it. And here are the data elements we're gonna need. And then uh, CMS can help by saying, you know, if you cover this, if we cover this, we want these data elements to be collected. And often those intersect with quality issues that CMS is concerned exactly. about. And, um, assuring qual quality yeah. and safety. And I mean, we would love to create the quality metrics that are used in our coverage that, you know, as the administrator, and I know she's the last speaker here, we'll talk about the equity issue and really using the claims data, other real world evidence to be able to see whether or not there's appropriate utilization by 
similar outcomes by all patient groups. Okay, well, with that context, I want to provide that context before turning to an issue that I know everybody here wants to hear more about, which is, uh, Lee, the recent Medicare national coverage decision on monoclonal antibodies for uh, Alzheimer's disease. So a um, lot of issues there. Um, maybe I could just turn to you for some initial comments uh, based on um, what you've, what, what the intent of the final decision was, how you listen to some of the comments and some, maybe some of the reaction you've heard since then. Yeah, and, and first, I, I just really like to, to acknowledge that our recent decision should not be viewed as setting a new uh, direction on therapies that receive FDA accelerated approval. Uh, in fact, as um, we talked about over the last few days, we CMS has covered drugs such as HIV and cancer that have received accelerated approval. More, more than 20 of these, I think, a lot yes, of them. Yeah. But <laughs> quite a few. So it's uh, this is really an uncommon situation. And uh, where we were looking at the drugs in this class that receive the accelerated approval based on evidence that it reduces plaque on the brain, but unclear evidence that it translates to a health outcome in this particular case, like cognition and function, and was tested on relatively healthy patients. And we're looking to ensure we were also looking to ensure that drugs in this class are reasonable and necessary for the treatment of an illness in the Medicare population who often have multiple comorbidities. Mm -hmm. So as we finalized the decision and, and spoke to the FDA, um, we followed the science, we used the evidence, we informed by the public, we got 10,000 comments, <laughs> which had to be read and, and sorted through. And we updated the final decision, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, that ensures access and approval for drugs in this class that have received accelerated approval through FDA and NIH clinical trials. And we also supported innovation by creating a path for certainty of coverage by this second pathway or what we call the long-term coverage pathway for new drugs in this class that obtain uh, traditional FDA approval without requiring opening a new national coverage determination, which was really our key goal here. And if um, so, if there's new evidence, we'll reconsider it. But in this way, there's a clear path to coverage. And um, the, the decision, the final decision made a distinction between, as you said, between drugs that have come along in this class in the past, that the evidence that you have now, uh, there, there are multiple additional drugs in the pipeline now with those um, uh, pivotal FDA authorized clinical trials expecting to read out in the coming months. And um, sounds like a, a, a different um, set of opportunities there based on what the evidence for each of those drugs shows. Um, there is still, I think a lot of people have asked about the, the post-market um, study expectations with coverage with evidence development. And, and I don't know if you wanna say anything more about uh, that for drugs that do meet that, that um, uh, primary uh, pivotal endpoint. And, and I think we will evaluate each one as it comes. We'll work close with the FDA on that. And you know, if the evidence is incredibly strong uh, for the signal of health outcomes, which is our statutory authority, and is really, and the harms are, are low, then while you have this pathway, we can do um, less data collection, and then we can reconsider it. But this way, there is clear coverage um, shortly after approval. And, and I know you said this, but just since it's uh, come up a lot, um, do you, there, there are a number of other accelerated approval drugs in the pipeline, in cancer, and some of these other areas. Um, you don't think anybody should be reading anything from this decision into those uh, future accelerated approvals? Certainly in, in the areas that have well-established pathways, as you said, cancer in particular, absolutely, no. Okay. We think it's gonna to continue to be a rare situation in which we do a national coverage decision on a drug. So rare, rare situation, I do wanna come back to that, but Jan, let me go to you. So FDA Commissioner um, Rob Califf and the CMS Administrator LaShure did release a joint statement mm -hmm. after this announcement, uh, noting that the agencies have distinctive authorities and Lee just talked about that uh, a, a little bit. But Rob also stressed the importance of smooth handoffs, working together, passing the baton. Um, comments you'd like to add on this? Well, you know, it's uh, difficult to spot the issues, and I think that's really one of the uh, critical points here. We have thousands of development programs we're overseeing between medical devices, 
biologics. I think they have 700 gene therapies. And, and lots more kind of, as you say, gene therapies, yes. gene editing, cell therapies. That's correct. Advanced diagnostics, stuff that hasn't really been right. even part of FDA's. Right, and um, yeah, I'm talking in a few, in a week or so about RNA therapeutics. I mean, RNA is a whole new molecule we have to work with, right? And, and it's much, it can target extremely well and they figured out how to get it into cells. So we're gonna see an explosion there of, uh, of very theory, including gene editing, okay? And uh, of course, cmRNA vaccines that we use for COVID are, are an we example. quickly covered them. Yeah. Found a way to cover them. But, uh, yeah, yeah, so, uh, I think, so with that huge panoply, um, we have to figure out um, where where should we make the link early and how would we do that? And what are the characteristics of uh, products that are going to kind of raise issues? I mean, one of the characteristics of diseases that tip often have accelerated approval, of course they are life-threatening mm -hmm. and they, um, but the ones that raise the most questions, I think, have a relatively slow progression. Like they don't kill yeah, you tomorrow. Like, like, like this one we're just <laughs> right. talking so about. a lot of the neurodegenerative diseases, which of course are very common in the older population, like Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's, so they don't, you know, you, in a two weeks, you're not gonna have an endpoint, right? Because there's a lot of noise and all kinds of things. So you have to do pr relatively prolonged trials. You're gonna have perhaps novel endpoints, okay? Because it's brown that hasn't been plowed before. So uh, we have to think about these things as we think about where to approach CMS because we can't put the whole portfolio be for them and say, oh, well, <laughs> think about which ones, you know, might cause a problem here or need need more coordination or whatever. Yeah. And, and I, I hope to, I mean, it, it, it's sort of, I, I see my former provost in the audience and, <laughs> and I spent 12 years uh, as a consulting professor at Duke and I'm sure with Janet and with Rob that, and I know the administrator, we're all um, determined to make sure that, that we really learn from each other and make sure that we understand the needs of both agencies to fulfill. Yeah, it's, and it seems like, um, just to pick on, on a common theme from both of you, is that um, this interaction is helpful. The cases where there may be bumps in the road or questions about going from approval or um, clearance to um, uh, use and coverage and use in Medicare are relatively rare though. I and mean, I know Lee, you all are doing some scanning in that regard. Um, but just getting back to, to Jan's question, I mean, this is a rapidly changing environment. I think a lot of product developers and patients have questions about, you know, for these, take these new therapies right. in, in principle or new diagnostics. In principle, there would be a, a smooth path forward. Maybe some of these product developers don't know um, the intricacies of CMS legislation. And as you know, Lee, since you're living it, huh. many of those coverage definitions came from you know the 1960s so that the benefit categories at cms are not very well aligned with modern medicine so you have to do some of this square peg round hole fitting janet's uh, fda has a lot of resources that it can put into kind of this horizon scanning early assessment maybe engagement with um, the broader community does that have implications or maybe how what you've talked about the spotting approach and and just you know, being able to identify and address issues in advance. Um, does that have implications here? Yeah, I think so. I mean, um, I don't think that FDA has focused on this, okay, as far as, uh, you know, the handoff. Uh, and I think it's going to be beneficial. And several things are coming together. We've already mentioned the real world evidence, okay, the example of TAVR, okay. So what what development programs would really benefit from this? And I don't think, you know, I think we really need to think about this collectively um, because it isn't just about, as I said, it's not about necessarily coverage with evidence developments. How can we get the best information? Because when the medical products are approved and go on the market, there's still many things we don't know about them. Okay, and it's not bad. It's just, that's how it is, okay? And can we develop a better methods of learning post-market that aren't so expensive, that aren't so clunky, that actually can uh, bring in evidence, uh, satisfy the FDA, satisfy the payer, satisfy the medical community, and figuring out, not, that's not gonna happen with everything. So how can we figure out those really good use cases that we could, um, that we could do this with? And I think that's gonna be the challenge going forward because 
I wouldn't have necessarily thought the monoclonal antibodies would have been, except they had a really large treatment effect. Okay, and so we were really able to pick that out in the yeah. real world evidence. Right, that made the real world stark. evidence much easier. It was yeah. so stark, like if you got a monoclonal antibody, right, you didn't go in the hospital, right, mm -hmm. and and so forth. So uh, we, uh, it's it's going to be a challenge, but I think it's really all part of uh, what Rob Califf always saw: evidence generation. Can we do this better? Can we really figure out? Um, those cases where um, this uh, some type of arrangement like this would really benefit everybody. And there, there, there's actually two parts to your question that are interesting. One is you glossed over, which I don't think people recognize. We, own, we have to have a benefit category. So my side of the shop, which I'm a career, um, it does not look at cost at all and, and is separate from the payment side but the payment side decides whether or not there's a benefit category, as you well know, having been on both sides of the shop. So we can't cover certain things, not because we don't want to. And believe me, there are certain things we desperately want to around issues, um, particularly uh, you know, uh, early chair. Yeah, some kinds of equipment. Devices. Preventive so, services has been a challenge. Unless it's in medicine. statute, yeah. we can't do it. So I think that's one part. The other thing is we are committed to getting things that work in a value-based world that you always talk about, faster to market and figuring out how together we're both interested in quality improvement, figuring out together how to get that evidence that outside of paying in fee-for-service world in the value-based world, how doctors and providers can figure yeah. out should they use this if they are responsible for total cost of care. How to generate that evidence. And maybe our, our next panel is gonna pick up on some of those themes. But Lee, I did wanna ask for product developers that, that have questions, you know, they're kind of ingrained in going to FDA early and their whole series of meetings that can be scheduled and so forth. You all put literally thousands of, of hours into, but there are opportunities to, to reach out to, to you all early as well too. People do all the time. Um, I'm very fortunate that uh, our principal deputy, John Blum, and the administrator, both are committed to getting us more resources uh, to be able to meet with all those people. I'm not sure we have enough for a thousand <laughs> products, and therefore I need Janet's help to say what are critical meetings. Um, you know, we have great scientists and, and epidemiologists, but I think that um, is a goal. One of the key things she, one of her six pillars is engaging with stakeholders. And stakeholders who want to benefit the public are really important with novel treatments. And just an editorial comment from my standpoint, having spent time at both agencies, so it's been um, really impressive to see the additional resources, capabilities developed at FDA over the last 15 plus years since I was uh, there dating myself. Um, but um, if you look back at, at Lee, the amount of resources in your office when I was there 2006 versus Today, it's actually gone down, and that's not in proportion, certainly, to what's happened in the biomedical innovation space and these questions that do come up. You know, these are not, again, national coverage decisions are rare. It sounds like from everything you're saying, they're going to stay rare, but these questions about is there a benefit category? How does coverage work? Uh, how could CMS actually help with addressing issues that, that FDA, concerns that FDA might have or that, or that doctors and patients might have? Uh, that align with your quality mission, those kinds of contacts seem like they'd be helpful. So editorial comment from me. Does, we have time for just a quick last comment from either of you. Anything that we haven't covered that you'd like to, uh, to leave with? No, I, I think, you know, for, for us and for me personally, the, the goal is to get life-saving, life-prolonging, um, improvement in functional uh, and, and cognition products to market as quickly as possible. And, and for us to have the evidence that patients know what is the right thing to take at the right place at the right time. And that's what I look forward to working very closely with the FDA and Janet and Rob and the entire team. Janet, and I know you've thought a lot about all of those issues and about how we can get better evidence faster too. Any final words? Well, I want to talk about the last panel, as you well know. Because... <laughs> that was back to <laughs> workforce issues. 
promise Janet <laughs> we're going to come back to workforce and training and things like that. Yeah. We, left today. we can do, we can work very closely. <laughs> you guys together. can work these out. <laughs> we can work very closely with CMS and unless we get um, healthcare uh, better managed and, on, uh, and, and directed and, and the workforce is very unhappy. Okay. And they train like for nine years and then they just have to do billing all the time. They don't like, nobody likes that. Just people start out idealistic. Uh, but then they turn, you know, they have $200,000 of debt or something. And so I'm, yeah, FDA is totally aligned with what Lee said as far as we want to get the best um, treatments out to patient and preventives and so forth, but we want information attached to it and evidence so that people know how to use it. And we would like to have the learning healthcare system so that we continue to generate evidence. Because even if we put something out, then we have the next thing, okay? And we don't have any way to say, well, which one should you use first if you're a patient? Okay, we had this development program over here and this over here. And then we have the issue of well, when should you stop? Okay, so many of these treatments, you know, well, you, if this cancer treatment, it's like, well, you should just keep taking them. Well, that's probably not right. Yeah. Okay, yeah. but we don't know when you should stop. So post-market um, evidence generation help can help fill many of these. Cases. All right, and can, I, I have to, because you brought up workforce. So tomorrow at the quality conference, we're ending where I interview Angela Duckworth on grit and the need to, for hope. Okay, well, for our workforce we to be able to keep them continuing. You want to give people good reason for hope. I want to thank you all, boys. So many challenges, but so many, so much opportunities to work together. Thank you all very much for joining us today. Thanks, Pleasure. Mark. Yeah. All right, and we're gonna go uh, straight into our our next panel on better evidence and sustainable access for medical technologies, building on many of the themes here. Maybe uh, Esther, you'll even be able to work in workforce. But let me introduce Esther Krofa, who is executive director at Faster Cures and a member of our advisory board here at the center. Thanks, Esther. All right, thank you so much, Mark. And we're making our way. All right. We oh, good to see you. <laughs> All right, well, we're going to pick up the conversation right where we left off with Dr. Woodcock and Lee Fletcher um, and talk about better evidence generation. And what a fantastic panel that we have to talk about that, which is really a panel that needs no introduction. We know all of you uh, quite well as leaders who've been working in this space for uh, quite a long period of time, decades, if, if uh, you will. Um, obviously, you can read more about them in the bio, but let me just go through really quickly who we have here on the panel. Uh, Michelle McMurray-Heath, who is the president and CEO of Bio. Ellen Siegel, who we know well, chairperson and founder of Friends of Cancer Research. Amy Abernathy, uh, who is currently the president of Clinical Studies Platform at Verily. And Mark Miller, who is the executive vice president of healthcare at Arnold Venture. So again, um, we're going to just jump right into the conversation that we just heard from Janet um, as we we're talking about better evidence generation, I actually want to start with, with you, Ellen, because when we talk about what's happening with medical breakthroughs, what's happening in biomedical innovation, there's a lot of innovation that's coming through the pipeline. You know, faster cures we talk about, there's 10,000 diseases, 7,000 of them are rare diseases, only 500 treatments and cures. We need more. Patients want more and patients want more faster. Um, so can you talk a little bit about what you see from a patient perspective and what the unmet needs are and what the implications are when we need better evidence, better generation of that evidence in order to determine appropriate use of these technologies that we want as quickly as possible. Oh, that's a big question. Uh, there's a lot. There's a lot. We're seeing extraordinary science. We have invested and we're seeing the results. Patients are living longer. We see enormous opportunities. We see CAR T-cell curative therapy, immunotherapy. We're seeing diagnostics that can really determine precision medicine. So we're really, and these accelerated pathways have made a huge difference. They're not perfect, but we're getting them to patients faster. 60% of all breakthrough is cancer. 90% of all cancer therapies are through an accelerated pathway. So there's a lot there. Now, of course, we have to figure out how to pay for them and we have to validate their benefit in a post-market situation. They're not perfect pathways, but they've made an enormous difference in patients' lives. Right. And then when we talk about that innovation pipeline, Michelle, I want to turn it over to you because as a leader of your organization, you see that pipeline on a daily basis. 
and you see companies who are looking for information on consistent information, I would say, on what kind of evidence is going to be needed for regulatory decision making, but also for coverage decision making. Can you talk to us a little bit about the key policies you think are going to be critical in this space? Yes, well, consistency is always one of the key most important elements. And it's not just for the innovators that are sometimes coming from small biotechs that are investing a decade, sometimes a decade and a half, of bringing a new therapy forward. But it's also for the really critical investment from a private sector that is choosing between, do I want to invest in Facebook or do I want to invest in a 15-year pipeline for a new therapy for patients? And so we have to realize that this is an ecosystem, a fragile ecosystem, one that has already been broken in Europe that is really, really difficult to sustain. And so this consistency is key. You know, it's so interesting with the last panel, you cannot put your finger on what was unique about this example that led to the extraordinary decision. And having clarity about what was it that was unique would be very, very helpful. And, you know, my gut tells me it's probably the scope of the indication. It was probably the shock of the public. It was probably that it was a first therapy for class. Um, and so knowing what those third rails are would be very, very critical because it would help innovators plot their course forward. And just to follow up there, who should provide that clarity? <laughs> I mean, it's difficult. I spent five years at FDA. I have a lot of respect for the science and the very, very careful rigor that they go through, the, the elaborate stakeholdering that they do, the public transparency that they give. Um, but it's an evolving space, right? So, you know, we are constantly evolving with the science. And so it's difficult to really predict where, as an early panelist said, the puck is going to go. But one of the things I think we're seeing happen in slow motion is that we have a system of regulatory and payment that's set up for large disease classes that are homogeneous. And where the science is going is to picking apart those big categories of diseases into very specific subpopulations that need very specific targeted therapies. And we don't have the regulatory system or the payment system to evaluate them and to compensate them fairly either. Well, that's a great segue to you, Amy, because you've spent your entire career talking about better evidence faster. We talk about more treatments faster, but you say better evidence faster. And as you look across this landscape, and even in light of Michelle's comment, what do you think is needed? And Janet talked about the role of real world evidence and talked about the example of monoclonal antibodies and, and how that had a large effect. So that was uh, certainly a useful example there, but as you look across the entire industry and the pipeline, what do you think we need to do either from real world data and evidence in order to achieve our goal of better evidence faster? So let me step back and first um, think about this concept of real world data and real world evidence. And the FDA put out a piece in the New England Journal in December of 2016, highlighting that real world data and real world evidence is evidence generated outside of the context of a traditional clinical trial. It can be prospective. So pragmatic clinical trials are real world data, real world evidence. Also leveraging also passive sources such as electronic health record claims data, even social determinants of health or environmental exposure data. So all of these now can come together to start to generate a new evidence source where we can now get towards something that starts to look like totality of the evidence pairing traditional clinical trials data with real world data coming from prospective and retrospective sources. The other thing is that through technology, scientific innovation, and really innovation across the healthcare delivery space, we're now identifying and being able to leverage better and better real world data and real world evidence sources that we can put to work for us in order to address some of the elements that Michelle mentioned. So that's the first part is I think that there's hope and that we've seen progress in this space. We've also started to see that there's an increasing focus on the post marketing or post evaluation part of the evidence generation um, landscape. And that's important for two reasons. First of all, um, as we have more expectation of evidence generation after the initial regulatory decision, something that Janet was highlighting, the demand for evidence generation, better evidence faster is going to go up. Mm -hmm. And also importantly, it's going to give us the opportunity to learn from what's happening in real world practice, starting to get 
to what Michelle was talking about of, of really understanding all the permutations and how to match care. We've seen this play out in mRNA vaccines and we could talk more about that. But then the question you also asked is what's it going to take beyond innovation in the data and tech side? And I think there are some policy actions we should look towards. Um, importantly, there's the work that's happening, for example, in the novel clinical trials and decentralized clinical trial space. We've seen that playing out in decentralized elements such as video visits and taking clinical trials directly to patients' home. And um, for example, Cures 2.0 might further that initiative. We've also seen the opportunity to uh, essentially give more teeth to the FDA when we do leverage accelerated approval and other pathways, which means that there can be an approval based on a smaller corpus of information and accelerated act activity, but not now the FDA has the teeth to require mm -hmm. evidence after that approval. And also, for example, in the Pallone bill, the opportunity now to pull back if the um, expectations aren't met. And then the last thing I would say is something that you heard about from um, Janet and Lee a moment ago, which is alignment between CMS and FDA and how we can leverage such alignment now to accelerate our evidence generation activities. And we might talk more about that. Yes, well, there's certainly a lot there that we're going to follow up and talk about. Mark, I wanted to turn over to you because a key question in the back, I think of all of our mind, particularly with this decision about the Alzheimer's drug, is it really about the evidence or is it about the cost? And you've spent your career looking at these issues, whether for MedPAC and now in our own ventures, and we talk about the need for better evidence, is it better evidence to contain costs or is it better evidence to demonstrate value for patients? Or is it the same question? We're, we're, I'm just um, you know, splitting hairs there. What's your perspective? So, I mean, I think I would say to your, to your last point, um, I, I don't see a big distinction in the, in the two, two points that, that you were making um, at the end. But to go back to the decision uh, that was discussed, and I, I do want to say that I think there is a role for accelerated approval and uh, you know post marketing analysis. But I think the decision around uh, the Alzheimer's drug was really a flawed decision, and I, I, I assume people are kind of aware of all of the things that went in into that, you know, behind closed doors the advisory committee, 10 out of 11 saying no, 11 persons saying the evidence isn't clear, um, kind of washing past the lack of clinical effect and ignoring the, um, you know, the side effects, brain swelling, bleeding. Often people said, well, but they resolved without incident, but even medical societies have raised a concern that outside of a clinical trial, would people be monitored as carefully um, as they should? Um, you know, the approval gave uh, the company, it was a wide open uh, label at the point, at the initial approval, the FDA revised it after the fact. And the FDA, I think was saying nine years to finish their, um, uh, to finish the, the follow up work. So, you know, my, view of this is, is that even without getting to the money, and I'm my entire career, and I was put on this panel to rain on this whole parade, <laughs> my entire career has about been about the money, but I, I really want to be clear about this. My own decision, and, and I these are not abstractions for me. I've taken care of somebody until recently for 10 years who had dementia, not Alzheimer's, but if this drug had been available for her, I would not have given it to her. So on that basis alone, before we even get to the money, then I think you flip over to CMS and CMS is a different set of re, um, requirements. And I thought that, that came out in the panel. And there is this question of reasonable and necessary coverage and cost. And I mean, people just blew, I mean, in making this decision, in my opinion, they blew past the cost. This is a huge cost for the taxpayer. This is a huge cost for a patient, even just an individual cost sharing a situation for the, for the patient. And so I think the cost, and if more of this is gonna roll through, this is going to be a huge um, issue. And I worry about things like this, and it's not just me saying this, there are medical societies uh, saying this as well. Um, the American Academy of Neurology was very pointed. They didn't take a position, but I have to tell you, if somebody didn't take a position on me and said the things that they said about this decision, 
I would be pretty upset. Um, and among them, you know, they raised issues about undermining the physician patient relationship. You know, the notion here that a physician who prescribes a drug is doing that with the confidence that the FDA has said this is safe and effective. They raised the, the, the price as an ethical issue. They raised the issues about um, not monitoring, not being able to monitor brain swelling and um, uh, bleeding. And they actually ended their letter saying that this threatened the very ethics that undermine the practice of neurology. And so I think there is a role for this. I think this particular decision was highly flawed and reflects what um, is the prop potential problem here. And I'll stop my comment now, but what I would like to get back to is I think there should be certain guardrails that people began to talk about in the last uh, panel, and maybe you were starting to talk about, that I, I think should be uh, in this process. Well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about the guardrails, and I, and I will come back to you, Ellen. Um, I have a question for you, particularly about this pressure around breakthrough and accelerated approval pathways. But let's talk about what those guardrails ought to be, Mark, because when we think about this, this is not, we heard, it's a uh, rare, I jotted that down, right? Um, it's not um, what we should expect for other disease conditions that are well-established and well-known, but in situations like this where we don't have well-established um, previous experience, what are those appropriate guardrails that will create consistency for innovators to ensure that innovation that actually makes a difference for patients can reach the market. Okay, so you're coming back. To back me. to you. Don't yes. All right, okay, my apologies. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, I, I think it's important that we continue to say randomized control trials, patient outcomes are the standard that we want. I mean that, there, but there are exceptions and that we should you know, allow those exceptions, but they should be the exception, not the rule. I think a lot of the discussion towards the end of the last panel where there's collaboration between FDA and CMS should be the order of the day and there should be engagement on the part of both agencies in order for them to say what they are looking for for their separate jobs to determine safe and effective or to determine you know, coverage um, and payment. I think that takes a lot more resources. You know, he said something about a thousand meetings and I, I completely uh, understand the problem uh, with that. But I also think the decision process needs to have accountability and be public. And it doesn't mean every meeting has to be public, but every meeting has to be discoverable. The meetings that occurred at FDA, people should have been aware of. And so I think there, and I also think that the staff that is working with the manufacturers to help them come along should be different than the staff who ultimately make the decision. If you grant the approval, the follow-up study should be specified in advance and, uh, with the manufacturer and you know, ideally to satisfy both CMS's and uh, the FDA's um, uh, requirements. I also think that there are, um, there should be sort of uh, stop or you know kill switches, if you will. So if it come, if the if you have uh, you know four years to complete a confirmatory trial, if you haven't completed the trial, the approval is gone. If you complete the trial and it's a negative, the approval is gone because we have drugs now that have completed their trials, they're negative and they're not withdrawn. And then finally, I think the manufacturer should be required to give a steep discount to the public programs while they're running their confirmatory trials to build a fire behind them to make sure that they do complete those trials. That's at least some of the guardrails that I would say. Well, I think there should be a lot of opinion about those guardrails and I'm curious to get the reaction <laughs> for the rest of the panel on that. Ellen, let me come back to you. Where is the pressure coming from questioning these pathways, breakthrough accelerated, wanting to ensure there's additional guardrails, wanting to ensure that they're achieving their goals, we're getting better evidence, and we're able to make the appropriate decisions from the evidence. Can you just talk a bit from your for perspective? Sure, for sure, it's not coming from patients or mm -hmm. oncologists or people who are treating these patients. The science is not perfect. There is uncertainty, but we, with the accelerated approval pathway and breakthrough, we are getting patients uh, treatment uh, years before, we must validate 
We have to have confirmatory trials. Nobody is suggesting that if a trial does not meet its endpoint, it should not uh, be taken off the market. I will tell you, in oncology, they're all meeting their endpoints. They are doing it within a time frame. And going back to Agile Hum and what happened, we can respectfully disagree. But what we can agree on is the process was flawed and did not help anyone by, by all. And I think the uncertainty that came out of CMS scared the uh, unmet medical need, the patient community, and people that are really waiting for these treatments. They're just not perfect. And I want to quote Amy Abernathy, hard, the hard mm -hmm. things are hard. Yeah. It's worth doing. Yes. Yeah. And, and Esther, I just think we forget mm -hmm. the history of accelerated approval. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you hearken back to 30 years ago when HIV patients were picketing the FDA and the NIH because they were facing a terminal illness with no good solutions, that is what accelerated approval is designed for. And yes, the first products that come through are not necessarily the most perfect products. If you think back to AZT, it was a panacea at the time, but now we know it had a much worse side effect profile, much less effective than some of the therapies that followed. That's exactly how the science progresses. That's what we want to see. So we can't assume that the very first therapy across the finish line is going to be the perfect solution, and yet we can't make the perfect the enemy of the good. We have to find a way to get these products out into medical practice, because as much as people like to idolize randomized controlled trials, and you know, as a physician scientist, I have lots of confidence in them as well, the dirty little secret in FDA is that they never reflect what happens in the real world. And that's in part because they're not diverse, they have a very narrow patient population, when CMS came out with their decision, they underscored that the population of the trial did not reflect CMS's population, and it did not necessarily reflect the treatment landscape that CMS patients were facing. And why did that happen? It was because the agreement on the trial design allowed it to happen. And so we have to make sure that we're using real-world evidence tools that Amy has done so much to pioneer to supplement that knowledge and that information so that we can get from good to perfect. And so on that, in terms of randomized controlled trials are the gold standard, double blind, we wanna make sure that we have a representative patient population. As new tools are becoming available, what are the opportunities, Amy, for us to make sure that it is ubiquitous across the entire ecosystem and we're not just talking about certain pilots and certain disease classes, um, that may have some benefit, but we don't necessarily see that for everybody. So, so the first thing I would say is, as we talk about the accelerated approval and breakthrough pathways, part of the reason we can have this conversation is that the basic science is really chugging along and getting better and better. And so our evidence generation capabilities and that part of the science also needs to continue to move along and be as inclusive as possible. So we think about the Agilehelm decision, CMS didn't say it must be a rigorous, very, very narrowly defined clinical trial. It actually said what we need are pragmatic trials that reflect the beneficiaries. And practically speaking, we can think about randomized registry studies in the future, lightweight interactions with people who put up their hand and say, yes, I'd like to be involved in research and you can um, leverage my information provided privacy and security expectations are met. And you leverage my information that exists in the ecosystem and otherwise this can be a randomized intervention to one intervention and another, and then very lightweight interaction with people to collect the outcomes of interest, including outcomes meaningful to Medicare beneficiaries, such as caregiver and patient reported outcomes, to be able to understand the performance of medical products across time. So that's one kind of innovation I think this space is starting to see. The second is the ability when we do have narrowly defined randomized controlled trials to now also have parallelized longitudinal registry studies that sit beside those that are more inclusive of all individuals so that when an individual can't really participate in the real randomized control trial, we don't miss out on the rest of that story. Right. Maybe that's because they have hepatic failure or, or, or liver disease and can't meet the criteria for that clinical trial, but otherwise their doctor has decided this is the right intervention for them. And then we can learn from their story as well. Again, the last thing I would say is these innovations are coming forward, but one of the things we can't do is miss out on the chance to have real people understand what's going on and going on with their information. So a key part of the evidence generation innovations of the future 
are actually around involving everybody in the process so that people know what's happening with their information. Well, that certainly was true during COVID. I think for the first time, uh, I know with many of us, family members are talking about clinical trials and what phase one, phase two, or phase three trials were like, and certainly an opportunity to capitalize on that education and awareness. Um, when we talk about specific use cases in this space about where better evidence generation is going to be needed, Amy, why don't we start with you? Just walk us through some use cases here. Are we talking about cell and gene therapies? Are we talking about advanced diagnostics? What are what are the specific upcoming use cases that you think are going to be critical to ensure that we have those examples that you just referenced, or that we have this parallel conversation happening between FDA and CMS? So I often think of the cell and gene therapy space as the poster child for where this story is going. Mm -hmm. Importantly, cell and gene therapies are often indicated for rare diseases or specific situations, often for children or younger in individuals, small indications where what may happen is this intervention may be approved on a small corpus of information, even a single arm trial based on comparison to historical controls. And now the need to really follow for the long haul, this group of patients. So there's two parts to this. One is being able to have enough compelling evidence to understand safety and efficacy to a level that guides that initial regulatory decision. And then the FDA has put out in many different contexts, there's the expectation of 15 years of longitudinal follow-up. So pairing the initial regulatory decision with 15 years of longitudinal follow-up tells us two things here. First of all, we're going to need the ability to have confident inf information in the beginning that then has the follow-on process. And the second is that 15 years of longitudinal follow-up is gonna to have to happen without overly burdening the very people who need these interventions, dealing with the fact that imaging like CT scans and diagnostics are gonna change over that period of time and how do we build that into our understanding? And then finally, how does the FDA and others have the right kinds of tools to pull back, for example, an intervention that's unsafe or be able to modify an indication as needed as we learn across time. And I think we're gonna to start to see this play out in many different indications. I mean, the idea is that we have a true learning ecosystem. Right. And, and Janet talked about that, where when you do have a product that's over the finish line and you had evidence at that particular time and you learn more later, you have the opportunity to pull back and adjust. Back. And I think everybody would want that, including patients would want to understand We've learned more that maybe this is not as effective for my particular case as, as it is for, for another. When we talk about the role of evidence generation, there's so many stakeholders involved. Patients are part of their own disease foundations and organizations where they're part of clinical trials or, or patient registries and the like. You know, Ellen, I'll start with you and then go down the line, Michelle and Mark, for you to comment on. What is the role of other stakeholders, FDA, CMS, but beyond that in industry, patient organizations and others to be part of this learning ecosystem that's focused on evidence generation, what are their unique roles and how should they really think well, about the policy going forward? They have to collaborate. They have to mm -hmm. collaborate. We have to, we have to work not in our silos. At Friends, we work with payers, we work with academics, we work with the FDA, and we work with clinical trial people to really get evidence so we have something that is believable. So we have to get out of our silos and not only do the patients who really, and they need to get the best evidence possible, but frankly, government agencies. I mean, they have compatible missions, but different missions. And we could have perhaps avoided this fiasco uh, if perhaps there had been better collaboration between FDA, CMS, and NIH from the beginning out of it. But we also have to understand these are not perfect. We have to validate these and postmark it, and we have to start these um, uh, uh, trials earlier confirmatory trials, and they have to, if they don't work, they have to be taken off the market, but we have to get out of our silos. Well, silo breaking is critically important. I mean, I remember at, at my time in FDA, we were working on parallel review, and we were trying to get CMS to come in earlier and earlier um, into decisions, and it's, it's challenging when the agency is really not staffed, even for their current workload, let alone for this additional workload. And often we would get the response we'd love to, but we just don't have the bandwidth. Hmm. And so I think we do need to do some soul searching and some thinking about how we're gonna properly resource, resource and staff um, CMS to deal with this new flood of new science that's coming down the market. But you know, I think we often to fail to understand completely how FDA makes decisions. You know, the decision for the first drug for an unmet medical need is a different benefit risk question 
than when it's the 10th therapy when there are five other highly successful and fully disseminated products out in the market. And so it is a sliding scale. And as patients, you want it to be a sliding scale because when you're waiting on innovation, it's important to have access to hope. So we really need to adapt our thinking, but we need plasticity in the regulatory system so that it can course correct because that's critically important. And it has over time. I mean, there are products from both the regular um, FDA approval process and the accelerated approval process that have been withdrawn from the market. And they're actually very comparable percentages. Um, and all of those are very you know, carefully considered decisions. So you asked the question and I could answer it, but I am gonna to respond to these comments. Um, it's the second time through on this. And there's a point where I disagree, which is I absolutely agree that the first one through the, uh, you know, through the funnel, there may be a different standard. I understand that argument, but I think the other side of that argument is who bears the risk for that. And so the concern that, that I have, first of all, when you say that there's a sliding scale and my company comes through first and I get approval, then the scale shifts for everybody behind me. And I don't believe that it can happen. I don't believe the government without being you know, indicated or you know, sort of sued for being arbitrary and capricious can change its standards. I think it should. I think the evidence should drive what the decision is. But the manufacturers that you represent are going to be right there saying, will you let that person? It happens every day. I, I understand. But I think what the, this decision in particular is going to start challenging that. I think the other shift that it, it's uh, kind of starting to push is where's the burden of proof of evidence? Is you, does the manufacturer produce the evidence and get the approval? Or does the manufacturer get the approval and then uh, produce the evidence? I believe there should be post-marketing evidence. I do believe there are cases when there is accelerated approval. I still think the clinical trial should be kind of the, the gold standard. These other data sources are good ways to supplement it. But the last thing I'll say is who bears the cost of making that decision? I mean, depending on like if two of the 6 million um, Medicare beneficiaries, when the decision was originally made, a third of them got this treatment, that would have been $50 billion a year. It would have been bigger than the Part B program, drug program in its totality now. And at my, you know, my point to you would be, if that's the way it is, then the manufacturer should bear the cost and not put it on the beneficiary, on the taxpayer. Well, but you know, that's an interesting point that you raise because if the therapy had proved to be 100% effective, reverse all clinical symptoms and have no side effects, would that cost have been too high? No, I mean, so, in that so instance, then it, so there, there's a coverage. Yeah, so we can't conflate the science with the cost. We're talking about the science here. And often it's about making sure that the patients that are most at risk, that respond most to the therapy in those initial trials have that you know, privileged access to the therapy while we are filling out a much more complete scientific picture. And that's important work to do. You always have pre-market data and you always have post-market data. And it's so um, gratifying to see how much the post-market data has just blossomed in recent years and really added to our understanding so that prescribers know exactly in what context, which product is useful and which product is not. Mm -hmm. Well, so, I, I, don't, I don't see the argument that well, says let me all of in. that could happen with the manufacturer yeah. paying for it. Yeah, I think there's- Well, patients. we can go back and forth. Let me just ask one more <laughs> question. You want to finish your thought, Ellen? Uh, ask no, no, I just said it clearly. There is a patient. We should not forget about the patient. Right, the exactly. Patient we should, right, we should not forget about the patient. And I think Michelle talked about where there is high unmet need, there's clear demonstration of value. Absolutely, you talked about the fact that that yeah, decision none would of be a very different kind, of, different kind of decision. Okay, so in our final moments here, I want to go down the line and talk about what are you the most optimistic about from an evidence generation perspective as we do see new tools and new opportunities to learn more in the post-market opportunities, where should we see policies evolve in the next, let's just say, two years? 
Amy, let's start with you. So I'm particularly excited about what's possible from the context of better technologies, better data, and actually being able to move the science forward. Therefore, what I'm hoping to see is essentially more capabilities at FDA and at CMS, but also across the research community to be able to make this happen. So I'm excited about the science and that we're getting to curative therapies yes. and we're getting to diagnose earlier when it makes a big difference and we can't stop. That's what I'm excited about. Yeah. Ellen kind of stole my point. You know, if, if when you're out every day talking to these really many young and excited innovators, they are not daunted by these huge disease classes that have plagued us for years with absolutely no solution. They are using the scientific tools of the future to strip apart these diseases into you know, the 20 subclasses that are actually gonna give us the chance to pinpoint the patients and get them the targeted therapy that helps them. And that is critically important for what's ahead. I just think given how badly this decision went, maybe this will drive change. That's a great note to leave the panel. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Really appreciate your time. <laughs>
less than 15% of people in low-income countries have even achieved one dose. Where are we with vaccine equity? And, and we are finally getting to the point where supply seems to not be the major challenge. And now it's really about this idea of turning vaccines to vaccinations. How are you thinking about, and, and I know the US government has a major program trying to move this effort forward. Um, how are you bringing together a whole government effort to do this? Yeah, that's been um, really important to us. The US has been engaging around the world on immunizations for decades, and it's important for me that I start there because you know we didn't just start doing this with COVID. We've been doing it with polio and with you know a number of other um, immunizations. Of course, that's been um, sort of you can argue limited to, to childhood vaccines, and yet um, we're trying to build on those existing platforms and initiatives. So we do have this global vax um, initiative um, that is whole of government, and we're really saying okay given all of the places where the US has been operating for decades, um, and given what the needs still are in many of those countries, what can we do to really join forces across US government? So whether that's with USAID and their operational capacity or State Department and their diplomatic capacity or a CDC and all of the other uh, resources that they bring to bear, that's it's sort of this I'm going to date myself if I say Voltron, but you know, this sort of transformer of sorts um, when it comes to the work that we're doing. And it's really important because, you know, it's got to be on hands, all hands on deck um, on the ground. And importantly, it's not just us sort of parachuting in saying, look, we are here to save or service you. It's, you know, us listening to these health ministers really say, well, actually, our issue is more around logistics, maybe a bit around workforce, you know, and plenty of other places, it is a confidence issue in certain communities. And so we're able to kind of like take these various solutions off the shelf that have worked to date, um, and really um, kind of show up um, in a way that's most meaningful to these governments. That's great. And how have you really looked at the, the details of the challenges here across different countries? And you know, we've talked here today and in many other venues about some of the challenges in the US and other places, whether it's around confidence, misinformation, and generating demand, or making sure that we're creating the logistics systems. And, and one of the things that I think many of us may not have appreciated going in is that in, in many low and middle income countries, they're actually dealing with even more complicated logistics and that they're often dealing with more vaccine types than we have mm. in the US. So not only are we getting vaccine late? We're getting it in a much more complicated way. Um, how is the US government trying to you know, smooth that process? Out? Yeah, we've at least tried to say, um, look, you know, <laughs> work with countries themselves to understand, again, what their needs are and give them a sense of what's coming down the pike. Um, to the degree we're providing these vaccines bilaterally, then we have those conversations directly. Um, and we not only you know, understand what their needs are in terms of quantity, but then we help them know, okay, well, we're actually going to be able to get you Pfizer, which is gonna require ultra cold chain storage, right? Um, uh, we also, to the degree we work through COVAX, which is still a majority of our, of our donations, that gets even easier because not only is COVAX helping countries understand what's coming from the US, but what's coming from other countries. It really takes so everyone playing in this way. We can't be the only actors who are giving countries a heads up. And what has happened, and it's been reported, is they don't always receive that. And so then they're asked to take in this influx of product. And then, of course, these countries get blamed if they can't get shots in arms, right? So it, you know, I think we have to be more fair, obviously, to governments around the world and you know, understand that they, you know, they, they are also trying to manage this as best they can. And frankly, we all had challenges when it came to getting shots in arms, too. Yeah. Let's switch gears a little bit. In addition to vaccinations, we now have oral antivirals therapies that could really be game changers from a global context because they can prevent severe disease, they can protect health systems, especially in those populations that maybe have gotten the least access to vaccines as well. In the same way that we are trying to ramp up test to treat strategies here in the US, your office has been thinking about the, the planning and how to actually roll out test to treat from a global perspective. Yeah. What is that gonna take? It seems pretty daunting. Yes, it does seem daunting, but we can do this. So, um, I, you know, it's not the same, um, therapeutics and vaccines, obviously, but we can learn from what we've been doing or trying to do with vaccinations. Um, we know that first and foremost, we gotta have supply. Uh, and so 
kudos to companies who have stepped out and kind of gotten ahead of that curve by establishing these agreements with say the medicines patent pool and you know uh, and with generic manufacturers even that matters because we need that product first and foremost now the timeline for that is going to be a challenge it seems and we saw that with vaccines right that lag and so we really still want that sorted with companies or manufacturers but that's that's part one i think part two is around other issues like uh, what was just discussed on stage, right? I mean, the, the regulation of these products or the, reg the authorization of these products is still going to be very important. And that was something behind the curtain that people didn't realize was happening. It wasn't enough just to authorize these products. You had to have these countries be able to actually, or it wasn't enough to have them be available. Excuse me, these countries had to authorize these products so that we can even ship them so that they can even receive them. Uh, and so, you know, what does it look like to, for these um, products by certain companies to be authorized or for these you know, generic versions to be authorized in a timely manner so that they can reach people in need. The last thing I'll say about test and treat or test to treat, which is how we're referring to it here, is um, the opportunity or even obligation to focus those efforts on those at highest risk, especially the, for those for whom vaccines perhaps are not as effective or who run the risk of having more severe disease, if not death from COVID. And you know, we've seen this movie before um, with people living with HIV, for example, but we, we know how to do that. And I do applaud you know, um, uh, Duke and others really uh, rallying behind that, um, that priority population, mm -hmm. really recognizing that people who have been uh, historically marginalized or left behind really stand the most to lose, stand to lose the most. And so um, I think that is very much, you know, at the core of a lot of the work, a lot of the ways I approach this work, obviously, but a lot of our conversations within USG. Yeah. And you mentioned populations of HIV and, and of course, you know, there's this fantastic program PEPFAR mm -hmm. um, that's saved more than 20 million lives. There's a President's Malaria Initiative. And we know that there's already some test and treat models underway there with the use of rapid tests for HIV, for malaria, coupled to oral therapies. How could we build from those capabilities? Well, I, um, one, we can. Um, I, I don't know exactly how it works. I do know what has been happening in the current pandemic is we've seen PEPFAR be utilized in you know, serving people already to date, right? Um, so whether that's around testing or vaccinations, you know, PEPFAR and PMI for that matter have been, you know, have, have shown their worth um, you know, 10 times over. Um, I, I wanna be careful sort of putting too much more on those programs in a way that doesn't allow them to deliver on their core mission. So that's, you know, that's always the dance. And I think for people who are, you know, really wanting us to end AIDS or malaria, that's really important to all of us. Um, but we'd be foolish if we didn't look to those programs um, as to, kind of how we can at least start the work of yeah. testing to treat. Absolutely. Now, if we pull back and building from some of the conversations we heard earlier today that people are tired, there's complacency, you know, maybe the majority's decided this thing's over, mm -hmm. um, but we're also dealing with limited resources in a global context. We've got health systems that are fragile, that are underdeveloped. And we're really, it seems to me, at a transition point where we're moving from two years of emergency crisis response to something that has to look more like sustainable yeah. COVID control, but one that links much more perceptibly to stronger preparedness. Mm -hmm. And that also helps to build the health systems we need in the future that can be resilient, that can deliver value, that can be person and patient centered. Okay. What, how do you think about this transition? It's incredibly difficult when you're trying to raise money a billion at a time for things that are um, that have such high return on investment and yet we're not getting financing to be there yeah. how do you not just focus on this emergency which we need to but also use this as a as a point of building mm -hmm. stronger infrastructure well we're able to do that to a degree um, and it's because we're all still living through this um, it, it's hard it's hard when you have um, a compilation of crises, right? Um, just I, you open up the paper and read today's headlines. It's, it's not easy. But um, unfortunately, because the pandemic has hit everyone, maybe not equitably, but it's, every, it's been, everyone's been touched by COVID-19 in some way, um, that is helping us make our case um, and make the case for um, 
for a dual approach, you know, preparedness and response. I think one other fear though, um, and that I've heard is that we're going to pivot too quickly to preparedness, you know? So if we can build this momentum around how we prepare for the next one, we, you know, run the risk of forgetting, no, we're still very much living through, through COVID-19 now. And, it's, and again, some more than others. So it's that walking and chew gum thing that we have to do um, for sure. And I think part of this has to also be about, you know, not just thinking of this as a security problem or global health security, right? Or even pandemics and health emergencies, but really focusing on the systemic issues that got us here, um, whether that's around political will and leadership or just access to care, right? Which is something that my boss talks a lot about. Um, that I think that's even harder, honestly, just to get people not only to think about this as an emergency, whether we're responding to it or preparing for it, but then to say, well, actually, we always should have been thinking about our health workforce and their, right, right. you know, their stamina and burnout and all of those things. We always should have really tried to dig more deeply into equity and how we truly solve that problem. So that's, you know, that's not for me to solve by myself. That's for all of us to solve. <laughs> but that's my take. That's that's great. And building from that, you mentioned workforce, um, which is a major issue certainly around the world, including here in the U.S. with burnout, with availability. Um, and perhaps one of the ways to start bridging to the future is thinking about small pieces of this, like how do we protect and build a workforce? How do we professionalize workforce, which is not always the case yeah. globally, but also how do we start thinking about building capabilities like surveillance, mm -hmm. which is certainly gonna be needed for the response and preparedness and, right. and to deal with other diseases. How do we think about strengthening primary care or how do we create the supply chain? Right. How are you thinking about the building blocks, so many of which are spread across you know, programs that cut across different parts of the government? We're thinking about it just like that. It's like yeah. you work here, I like it. <laughs> um, so, um, I mean, I think you know, there could be a question of what, what we tackle first. Um, and you know, I'd say we're, we've been paying a lot of attention to surveillance. I think that's the easiest thing to bring over and kind of that the fire we can keep burning, um, but workforce is another you know big focus area of, of ours in these conversations. So that's you know starting point. I think a third pillar of this is around the supply chain and you know just how product moves around you know and gets from planes to people. Um, so that's you know that that's our approach right now. I think um, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the international negotiations around what comes next, right? So yeah. um, my office um, and, and team have been very involved in those conversations at the WHO and really trying to understand you know, how we, where we go from here, you know, how we rebuild yeah. um, in a way that prepares us uh, appropriately. So that's another part of the equation. And I think that that framework will also help us prioritize um, of like where we start, um, it won't include everything, I think, by design, but importantly, um, we're not just looking to ourselves, but looking to the general public to advise um, what that should include so that we get it right. Yeah. So building from that, you had a chance to host Dr. Tedros, the director general of the WHO last week. You've been spending a lot of time thinking about what does come next. Mm -hmm. There are some negotiations underway. There's some public sessions coming up. What should come next as you think about what we've learned about what we might call global health architecture, yeah. what's worked and what hasn't worked in the last couple of years? Yeah, we, um, we've been taking a two-pronged approach in the US government, which you know. Um, so there's already an existing structure, and structure might not be the right word, but a set of protocols, the international health regulations that you know should have, should have maybe worked better than they did, but this is why we're tackling it. Um, because we, we know that it requires tweaks. And so the US government and other countries are coming together to kind of look again at those regulations to say, okay, before we have sort of years long conversations about perhaps some international agreement, what can we already um, change that will protect us um, in the coming months or you know, in, the, in the medium, if not short term. But then there's this other work stream around this international agreement. And that's much bigger and broader um, because the international health regulations don't cover everything, notably a lot of the issues around equitable access. Mm -hmm. And so it's our hope um, and determination, I might say, that those conversations really dig more deeply into those types of issues. And together, 
those two areas, this international agreement or convention or whatever it's going to be called, right. and these international health regulations can finally kind of create the architecture um, that prepares and protects us into the future. Yeah, no, thank you. And one of the challenges has been here at home in terms of getting more resources to continue this global effort. If we track what's happened over the last few weeks, we heard initially you know, what USAID and the State Department were thinking was something closer to maybe $18 billion needed for this global response. That got cut down to maybe 10 billion to help support and move this. And the negotiations got to five and then one, and we're now at zero. What does that mean? Uh, it means I've had a lot of sleepless nights. <laughs> and um, yeah, it means we unfortunately, our work gets harder to get shots in arms and to even explore some of these other initiatives around getting therapeutics around the world. It doesn't mean the work stops. We, we keep working um, and we keep finding maybe new and different ways to get it done. Um, but I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that we don't need those resources because they matter, right? Um, it's always been both and. Um, we need the funding uh, to provide this level of assistance, um, whether it's you know getting vaccines to folks, whether it's um, a lot of the work of the Global Vax Initiative, as I mentioned already, um, you know boots on the ground, um, or even some of this you know higher level um, policy engagement. But you know we what we are making sure that we do is still continue our ongoing conversations and partnerships with groups like the G7 and G20 mm -hmm. um, and otherwise um, really trying to at least move the needle when it comes to others' commitments and actions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think there are a lot of countries around the world that face the same challenges that we do, right, um, in their own parliaments. So um, we've, we've found some common ground with some of those partners and we've uh, tried to come together to ask, okay, well, what what now? The work can't stop. It's stalled, but it can't stop completely. Yeah, and as you've pointed out, you know, American leadership is important, not just to this crisis, but has been historically to every global health crisis around the world. And part of that leadership is going to be a, a next leader summit that mm -hmm. President Biden is going to host in the coming weeks. As we're um, closing in on our time, perhaps you can preview for us, what would success for that summit look like? Well, it looks like us keeping ourselves honest, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's, we're not just showing up to say, oh, you know, like we said we were gonna do this, so we're just gonna do it. It's not just a box checking exercise. I think, especially given where you started this conversation today, there's a, there's a need to really, I think gut check among a lot of us, um, not just across governments, but across all stakeholders to say, well, where are we in this? You know, and where, where do we collectively feel we need to go? There's a certain conversation happening at Duke or at, you know, within the US government or elsewhere, but there, what does it look like for us to convene 50 stakeholders to get their take on this and even come to consensus around how the shifts or the roles we play in that shift? Yeah. I think that's gonna be important at baseline let alone then setting or following up on very clear commitments, right? Like, okay, well, there has been this target to vaccinate the world, you know, at least 70% of the world has been put out there by the Secretary General, by the Director General of WHO, you know, where are we with that and what steps we have to take to get there? And are there other markers or milestones that we should be targeting mm -hmm. given where we are, not just with that goal, but where we are in the state of the pandemic? So that's the, the conversation we're hoping to have. We, we want it to be meaningful. We don't, you know, we don't just want it to be sort of one more meeting people attend. Um, uh, and so it's, you know, I think it's on us to ensure that it, it feels like a place where people can show up um, and that will be essential for us to make that progress because the, the people are counting on us. I mean, that's what matters too, right? Like everyone tunes into these meetings, virtual or otherwise, and they're like, well, what are you doing now? I'm still sitting here <laughs> wait, waiting on the world to change. And, and I think we have to deliver on that. So that's our hope going into the summit. And that's why the president is still so committed to making this happen, even with all of the headlines is because he knows how urgent and essential this is at this time. That's great. We certainly need more moments to keep us honest. So thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for your leadership in this really important time. Please thank me, please help join me in thanking uh, Lois Pace.
We're going to welcome our next panel as we go. And to, we're going to welcome Charlene Wong, who's the Assistant Secretary for Children and Families at the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, and also Associate Professor of Pediatrics and Public Policy at Duke. All right, well, we're going to shift gears, uh, though this could cover, I think, domestic and global, because we are here today and now to talk about preparing the next generation of health reform leaders. So when we think about, you know, what is the most important resource needed to do all of the things that we've been talking about today, which is really healthcare transformation, it's really the people. Um, and unfortunately, I think we've heard already today, there are multiple shortages when it comes to people, certainly We've heard about some workforce shortages. And what we're really gonna talk about today is what about getting that, the, helping address the shortage that we have around the diversity and the skill sets of the people that we need and that we know we need to actually make this healthcare transformation work come to life. And also the types of education and training programs that are needed to support those who are interested in doing more of this work and hopefully getting more people interested in doing this kind of work. So we've been hearing a lot today about doing this transformation work and how important it is that we do together. And so today I'm joined by Toyin Ajayi, who's co-founder and CEO of CityBlock, and Nancy Ann DeParl, who's managing partner and co-founder of Continents Capital Partners. And we're really gonna be talking about how can we make sure that we've got the right people who are able to do this work together as we've been talking about, both contemplating, ideating, coming up, with what these next things should be. And then like we've been talking about today, it's really about the how, making them also come to life. So Toyin, I wanted to start our conversation with you. You're a family medicine physician by training. You're also now the CEO of a really innovative company, not just talking the talk, but really walking the walk and city block of providing whole person health, meeting people where they are. Would love to hear from you your thoughts on what sorts of skills and capabilities are most needed so that we can have we can get that next trans, next generation of health transformation leaders. Thank you so much. For, first of all, thank you for um, for inviting us to this conversation. I think it's such an important um, thread through the discussions today, and so I'm excited that we get to spend time really thinking about the people that make this all happen. Um, you know, I think there's so many layers to answering your question, Charlene. I think um, we start at the leadership level when we talk about uh, the skills and capabilities that are required to unsee what we know and unlearn what we already know and imagine a different world, a different way of delivering healthcare, a different way of administering our dollars, a different way of incentivizing care, a different way of measuring outcomes. Um, and what does it take to, to for, particularly for folks like us, like the two of us who've gone through medical training and residency that is all about um, reiterating the status quo. We all trained in primarily fee-for-service environments, even if they were um, focused on serving underserved and marginalized communities, we were learning a way of practicing medicine that was incredibly circumscribed. Um, four walls, patients come to us, we do things to them, they leave, we talk about them behind their back, we wish they did other things, they come back again. It's a cycle that continues mm -hmm. and continues. And so what does it take to reimagine the healthcare system in a way that is oriented, frankly, around a different center of gravity, around the patient, the community, the family, the household, um, and then to deliver against that. And I think, um, uh, I think there's actually a lot of unlearning of our traditional healthcare system that needs to happen, starting very early in medical education um, uh, with, with opportunities for folks to learn different disciplines, sociology, anthropology, economics, um, to really bring in a whole host of, of skill sets that allow us to marry and acknowledge the relationship between how we pay for care and the care that's actually delivered. Because one of the other things that was really interesting, I think, learning medicine um, was that it was actually a little bit taboo to talk about how we got paid and how healthcare got paid for. Um, we were taught that, um, that good healthcare treats everyone the same, irrespective of this patient um, you know, sleeps on a park bench at night every day and doesn't have enough food to eat, or this person happens to be the child of the CEO of the health system, we should treat them the same. That was sort of valorous in medicine. And the truth is that that is the opposite of equity. That, um, ignores the totality of a person, ignores their payment structures that, that govern their care, um, and really um, blinds us to that. And so I think there's a lot that we can do to sort of unlearn medical education. Um, and then when we talk about the workforce that's doing the work every day in the field, I think what we've learned at CityBlock 
is that we need to bring in people from very different backgrounds to do that work. Um, and we really have to index on skill sets and capabilities that are oriented around community care, around understanding the totality of people's lived experiences, around um, being trustworthy and engaging, um, being able to be tenacious about solving people's needs, excellent communication skills. Um, those types of capabilities and skill sets have been critical in bringing in different types of workers into the healthcare ecosystem. Community health workers and doulas and others has been also really critical. And so I think there's a lot of layers in which we really need to unpack and rebuild our traditional healthcare system and the, and the types of skills and talents that, that succeed in this, in this space. Thanks so much, Toyin. Nancy, I wanna to go to you. You are a policy expert. I've been doing this for a long time in a lot of different settings. You also are quite familiar with the Duke educational programs, both within Duke Margolis and within the broader Duke environment. Would love to hear your thoughts on what are steps that policymakers, what are those policies that are needed to really get us that next generation of health transformation leaders really as quickly as possible? Because I think we've certainly heard today, there's a lot of urgency, both because of the pandemic, but even before the pandemic. There, there is an urgency to this work, um, Charlene. And as I thought about the conversation you and Toy and I had about today, um, I wanted to spend a few minutes both, uh, I know we're supposed to be looking forward, but I wanna spend a few minutes looking back um, as well, because I think today um, is a day to celebrate um, how far we've come as well as acknowledge how much really hard work we have let, yet to do. Um, and in doing that, I wanna pay tribute to some of the people who helped with my education as a health reform leader and a non-clinician, um, starting back in the day when I was running uh, the agency formerly known as HICFA. Uh, so that would start with one of your mentors too, Bob Master at the Urban Medical Group. Uh, Bob Margolis, who um, started off our conference today and is the, the leader and, uh, and founder of the Margolis Institute at Duke, uh, and his colleagues at Healthcare Partners who were leading the way decades ago. Um, Jeff Kong, who's sitting back there and who was the first chief medical officer at CMS. Um, Liba Lesson, um, Alan Hoops and Shelley Zinberg at Caremore Health, who I worked with early in my career. I'm trying to reimagine the way Medicare uh, Advantage could work. And now clinician servant leaders like Toyin, who I just find so inspiring to work with. Um, looking back to that time running CMS, an episode stands out in my mind that illustrates how challenging it can be uh, to transform government coverage and payment systems. Um, as Toyin said, you can't even talk about it if you're a doctor. And if you're on the other side of the ledger in the running the government, that's all you talk about. What is the CPT code? That's all we can pay for. It all has to be medical. It has to be reducible to that. Um, Jeff Kong will remember this um, incident. We had just proposed a new episode-based um, home health payment system for fee-for-service. And as part of it, we proposed to require home health agencies, home health aides, to do what we called a start of care assessment of Medicare patients to ask questions that would get at their living situation, whether they had anyone to help them take their medications, whether they uh, had food in the house, were they eating properly. Um, what we didn't call it then, but what we would now call it is social determinants of health. Mm -hmm. So we were taking just one little baby step towards that. And we wanted to be able to take those things into consideration and reimbursement and measuring quality. Well, we were well-intentioned, Jeff, but um, all hell broke loose when we proposed this new outcome and assessment information set. We got called up to the secretary's office to explain it. We got hauled up to the Hill to explain it in multiple meetings. And, and one that I remember most vividly, Dr. Kong and I sat there as a prominent Democratic Senator excoriated us for the new burdens we were imposing on home health aides. And in particular, um, he, had, he had posters made of the questions that he had around his office and sort of made us read each one aloud. And he said, you know, do you live alone? You have a scheme to try to find out if the Medicare beneficiaries are gay. Whoa. Whoa. I know. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> so um, Dr. Kong, I'm glad I had him with me, patiently explained why it's important to know these things. But I don't think we really won that particular senator over. And the example points out how hard it can be to sit in Liz Fowler's seat, who was up here earlier today, um, Mark McClellan's seat when he was in the government, Scott Gottlieb's seat, Chiquita, who will be here soon. 
um, and how hard it can be to craft policy that gets us where, Toya, and where you wanna go and where you know you have to go to care for patients. Um, a decade later, we made more progress with the Affordable Care Act and now uh, CMS routinely, Liz Fowler's office, uh, Center for Innovation routinely issues uh, regulations and guidance that talk about um, equity and social determinants of health. So I would say our policy vision has improved, but we have work to do in execution, which means preparing the next generation. And as I put on my hat as a, as a Duke trustee, I think there's three essential elements to that. One, finding and supporting, and since this is Duke, I'll add educating, um, empathetic, mission-driven, resilient problem solvers. Note that I did not say, with all respect to my colleagues, um, MDs. Mm -hmm. uh, they're necessary, but not sufficient. I think we all agree on that. Secondly, attracting uh, these talented people, whether young or older, uh, to do this work. And the best way to do this, in my opinion, is by exposing them to Toyin. That's step number one, or someone like Toyin, if there is anyone like Toyin. <laughs> Uh, but, I, but I say that in seriousness because I know that that's part of what um, the Margola Center and you and your colleagues are doing, is making sure that students at Duke get that opportunity. And third, rewarding them with financial and psychic benefits that are sufficient to make them want to invest in this work as a chapter in their careers. And I say psychic benefits because, Toyin, I'll never forget the joy in that young woman's voice uh, and her face, who was one of your neighborhood coordinators when I spent a day with you, um, she was reporting at a team meeting about having solved temporarily a client's housing problem, uh, which was crucial to that client getting the care that they needed. Um, and that's what, those are the kinds of people we need to attract and, and continue to give them those psychic rewards because she wasn't coming in just for the paycheck. Um, one of the best examples I've seen of an effective program to educate this next generation of health reform leaders and doers um, is at Duke School of Medicine, and it's called Root Causes. Um, it's run by Duke medical students, but importantly, from what I could tell, is a very um, uh, equality-based organization and, and um, features and and uses volunteers from throughout the Duke community, whether they're professors at Duke, students at Duke, people who work there, just people in the community. It aims to address food and housing insecurity for low-income Duke medicine patients with chronic diseases. One of the programs is run out of the Duke outpatient clinic, and it's simply called Fresh Produce. Mm -hmm. And what they do is that patients are referred uh, by the doctors in the outpatient clinic, by the teams, they can either pick up fresh food or get it delivered by volunteers along with recipes and nutrition help. And some of those patients have come to work in volunteering to help the community. It's kind of what you're doing as well. Um, it's a hands-on, non-medicalized, non-CPT code <laughs> way to engage not just medical students, but the whole community in promoting the health of their patients. Uh, so that's critical. And I guess one more thing I would add is we need researchers which is another part of the Duke um, enterprise. Great, well, thanks so much, Nancy Ann, for those comments. Um, you know, you, you mentioned Nancy Ann having leaders and training leaders who are young, old. I wanna ask about folks who are, you know, maybe in that mid-career stage. And I ask because as we, when in, our, in that conversation that we had preparing for this, one of the things that made me think about is one of the programs that we're really trying to transform, not just our healthcare system, but touring like at City Block, health system, social system, educational system for children is a CMMI funded model called Integrated Care for Kids. And one of the things that we've identified in trying to build the workforce that's really doing that work on the ground with kids, families, frontline providers, is that it's been very valuable to find folks who have been a childcare social worker for a decade someone who's worked in the early childcare and education setting, knowing how hard it is to get a child enrolled into a pre-K program, someone who's worked as a behavioral health care care manager, trying to find a placement for a young person who's in real crisis and having a behavioral health emergency. But then also finding those folks and then being able to help provide some training and coaching around some of these skills that you all have been talking about, the problem solving, the communication, 
thinking at, a, at one level up to at the system or population level. Curious your thoughts on, you know, programs that you've heard about or that we should contemplate together to really help some folks who are looking to have that chapter, you know, investing a chapter in their career to do this type of work. Because I think it's that lived experience and professional experience that, you know, really bringing that to the table to do this whole person care and transform our systems. Yeah, I'm happy to start. I mean, um, so we, we employ a, a big group of folks that we call community health partners at City Block, um, whose role it is to anchor the care team. They're focused on um, understanding the totality of what our members need, um, on building longitudinal relationships of trust, um, of understanding really the social drivers and then addressing those social drivers. It's this exact person that you described. Um, and what we found to be really interesting is that, um, is that the, the core kind of inherent capabilities that you need, you can't really train for. These are people who just get it. And by it, I mean, they get what it feels like to live in the circumstances that our members live in, to live in poverty, to feel like you are um, forgotten, to feel, to have felt dismissed by the healthcare system, to have felt disrespect from the healthcare system, to worry about where your next meal may come from. That's the stuff that they come to the work with um, and, and then we train them on everything else. How do you understand the signs and symptoms of a clinical need or a mental health need? How do you deescalate um, uh, really tense environments? How do you use our technology to follow up and make referrals? We can train all those other things. You cannot train for um, that deep empathy, that accountability to one's own community and that lived experience of, of really struggling um, uh, that, that drives that sort of sense of relationship. Um, and because of that, we found that actually a lot of folks later in their careers are actually perfectly suited for this role. Um, but we've had to create our own training models for them because um, all the things I described, that lived experience, that ability to build trusted relationships, that um, we actually ask people, you know, tell us in their interview process, tell us about a time when you helped somebody else in your community. And, um, and research supports this. Um, lower income people are more generous in general than wealthier people. And that's, you think of that as a proportion of what they have. Um, and we see that in the experiences of the people whom we, whom we hire. Um, those skills and attributes are typically not valued by our labor market. Um, if, you just, if it doesn't come along with an advanced degree, um, if it doesn't come along with, um, with student debt that goes along with the advanced degree, um, uh, these, these, these are not valued skills. These are the folks otherwise who would um, be, uh, really have only available to them jobs in the service industry, um, hourly wage jobs, jobs that don't value their, their lived experience uh, and compensate for that. And so I think there's a couple of like lessons for us. One is if we really truly believe that um, that your social needs, your social milieu are as meaningful, if not more meaningful drivers of health outcomes um, as your medical and behavioral health needs, then we should value the people who are skilled to do that work. And that means we should compensate those jobs fairly. Um, that means we should invest in these individuals with education, with um, continuing learning, with career advancement opportunities. And that means we really have to understand what it looks like to train these folks to be effective emissaries and complements to the medical system. So they can actually translate across those two spaces. And today there are not that many um, structured programs or curricula that do those things. Um, and uh, again, going back to sort of, you know, the theme of the day, value-based care and other payment structures, there's not a lot of um, codified payment structures to reimburse for that work and to re reimburse for those skills and talents. And so um, we've had to create some of that in the, in the context of having the latitude of a value-based mm -hmm. care structure to reimburse the care that these people provide um, in, a, in a measure that's commensurate to the outcomes and the value that we get. But there's a real opportunity here, I think, to scale these types of models and approaches and to codify the importance of this, this skill set um, and, um, and the value that it can drive to the healthcare system. We basically also created our own training program because we couldn't find, you know, other things that were available to us. And I'll just put an extra plug in for making sure to compensate families, because when we're thinking about having that lived experience, family voice at the table, and I will give a shout out to Liz Fowler and CMMI, because we asked and pushed for, could we compensate our family council members who are part of our design and implementation team? You know, they were able to, we were all able to get to yes, because they should be compensated the same way the rest of us are for the, our time on this work. It sounds like we should replicate what you've done in other places. If you've set up a training program that works. Yeah, make it, make it easier. Right, yeah, make absolutely. it easier. Absolutely.
Nancy, any thoughts from you on folks who are, again, that middle career investing that chapter perhaps later in their career? Well, I think, you know, one way to attract them is to expose them to the rewards of this work. And so how do you do that? How do you, um, I mean, do you sponsor, come spend a half day at, no. at City Block? No, I'm embarrassed to say we don't. Oh, no. <laughs> Look, you're busy, but that might be a way to do it. Go, yeah. You know, if you can find the right audience, yeah. uh, let them see it. My sense of your, of your teams was you could have someone who had a bachelor's degree from you know, an Ivy League university next, next to someone who was a community worker who had never gone to college. Yeah. And they both were doing the same job yeah. and they were learning from each other. Yeah. Um, so that's exciting. And I think it will be exciting to some people in mid-career to see a chance to really you know, have a mission and, and values like that. So how do we expose them to it? Great. Well, last question, actually leading into our last panel, which is focused on equity. So we are thinking again, looking ahead, building the workforce pipeline, building a diverse workforce pipeline that better matches the communities that we're serving. Um, thoughts there on some you know, top strategies that you would look for all of us in this room to employ to build that more diverse and robust pipeline of next generation health transformation leaders who are also diverse. Yeah, I mean, so many, um, so many places that there are, there's, there's a sort of comic book of like, you know, you can substitute a whole bunch of different um, sort of demographics, you know, people start at the same finish, start at the same start point, starting point, one person has a clear road to run ahead, the other person has to jump through an obstacle course. Um, if you're a person, you know, coming from a low income community, if you're a person of color, if you're a person with a disability, um, if you're a person who has struggled in their early childhood, um, and experienced early trauma, like, you're, you're having to jump through all the hurdles just to get to the to the same point as everyone else, especially in medical education. But I think it's true across all of the health professions. Um, and, um, and we have to start like eliminating all of those systematically, start from the top, you know, access to, um, to, uh, to education, um, uh, funding for postgraduate education, um, uh, the selection criteria that we use and what we value for people going into the health professions are not the things that actually matter. Um, the whole thing needs to be sort of rethought from the very beginning. But I do think that there is, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of power to those early experiences and that early exposure. And I think for, um, for particularly in, in medicine and in, um, as physicians rather, and as advanced practice clinicians, I think folks were really exposed to a lot of what is not great about healthcare particularly in the, in, the, in the places where we need providers in, in primary care. Um, they see burnout. They see, you know, the fee for service, like just spiral. Um, they don't see the, the things that I see, you know, that home visit with a family where you were able to um, not only provide for their medical needs, but build a relationship and solve a social need that will translate into better health outcomes. What they don't see as the team meeting where, you know, the, the community health partner helps to secure housing and you know, therefore you can start somebody and, and they may actually sustain treatment for their mental health or for their substance use disorder. Um, we, don't, we don't have enough models of those for people to see when they're even entering into healthcare to recognize that there is a different way. And so when I, you know, when I talk to residents and I talk to medical students, um, part of the role I think that we have to play is as evangelists for what comes on the other side um, and to really help paint the picture of what a long, we hope, and fruitful and rewarding and fulfilling career in healthcare can look like. And that's not just for the clinicians, it's for everyone whose who's, who's business is to help make other people healthier and safer and more fulfilled. There's a way to do that that is rewarding. And, um, and we don't see enough of those examples. The last two years have been kind of disastrous, frankly, for the, for the sort of public brand and reputation of healthcare in many ways. Um, and, um, and we have to undo that. And I think sharing some of these messages and, and being able to evangelize for what it could look like is, is so important because that's how we attract the best and brightest folks, the most capable, the most talented, the most mission aligned people to do work that's hard often and is never gonna be as well compensated as other options available to them, but is you know, the most rewarding and enriching work that a person could commit their life to. Um, we have to create that path and create that real vision for people so that they can follow a roadmap that makes sense to them. And I'll just go back to the example I gave, um, which uh, the same day I met you, Charlene, we heard from medical students at Duke about root causes, about fresh produce. There's, there's also a, 
um, uh, a program devoted to housing. Mm -hmm. They're looking at all the needs their patients have. And if they're getting that exposure in medical school, something tells me they're not going to just graduate, walk away and get on the, you know, treadmill, mm -hmm. um, the fee-for-service treadmill. They're going to keep looking at it. So those, those kinds of opportunities are really important to this, I think. So what I'm hearing is a call to action for all of us to evangelize a little bit, to invite some friends to come to work with us for a day, <laughs> see what it is we do to transform health and healthcare and the systems that serve people. Well, thank you, Toyin and Nancy Rand, so much. Um, and now I would like to welcome Susan Denser, President and CEO of America's Physician Groups to the stage, who will moderate our final session on addressing health equity through healthcare reform. Thank you so much, Charlene. And yes, last but hardly least now, this panel on addressing health equity through healthcare reform. And I'm so delighted to be welcoming my interlocutor here, Chiquita brooks Lashur. Chiquita, as everybody knows, is the administrator for the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS. She oversees these small programs, Medicare, Medicaid, the Children's Health Insurance Program, healthcare.gov, health insurance marketplace, et cetera, et cetera. Um, she is a longtime policy official, that's long time, not old, <laughs> long time, who played a key role in guiding the Affordable Care Act through passage and implementation. She has lots of experience in the federal sector at various levels in the executive branch and on Capitol Hill, as well as in the private sector. Uh, she was formerly the deputy for deputy director, excuse me, for policy at Sasio, the Center for Consumer Information and Insurance Oversight. So playing a key role in the standing up of the exchanges. And before that, director of coverage policy. She also led the agency's ACA implementation. And before that, she was in the House of Representatives working on the Ways and Means Committee uh, after having done a stint at OMB as well, uh, analyzing Medicaid. So as I say, lots and lots of experience, a lot of water under the bridge over the years, Chiquita. So as we think about equity in health and healthcare, if we were up at the 30,000 foot level, we would look down on what we see today and we would see lots of little dots, little beachheads of equity that maybe we didn't even see a few years ago, which is good. Let's, let's frame this from the positive. And since you took the helm at CMS, we've seen the paving the way to equity progress report put out looking back at the 2015 to 20, mm -hmm. 2021 era. We've seen the strategic refresh mm -hmm. that you and Liz put out mm -hmm. uh, on the work at CMS and CMMI. Uh, we've seen the transformation of the direct contracting model into ACO reach, which has the word equity now in its mm -hmm. name, uh, front and center. Uh, we've seen announcements of coming steps to tweak Medicare Advantage mm -hmm. in certain ways, maybe put an equity index into the star rating system, et cetera, et cetera. So there's lots happening. Uh, and you've talked about doing even more. Because life and government goes by in dog years, mm -hmm. right? This is all going to go zip by very, very quickly. When you think about your top priorities, achieving equity in our health programs, what do you think, what's at the top of your list? So I would say a couple of things. As you started, you know, we, lots of people are working on health equity across, across the country. Um, I, I think a lot, uh, I, I like to reflect and I, I have started saying to the team and to others that the ACA was born out of a difficult time. And I think that there were questions about, should we do health reform when the Affordable Care Act passed? But we really, as a country, saw this moment of economic crisis where the lack of health coverage was actually causing problems to our healthcare system. And I think the same thing has happened through the COVID-19 pandemic. We didn't use the words health equity in language in, except in small pockets. And now I think our, we as a healthcare system more broadly really understand that we have to ha 
address health equity, not just because it's the right thing to do for the people affected, but because we as a country have got to solve this issue for us to be able to operate and thrive and be able to survive the pandemic. Because when the least among us don't have the healthcare coverage they need, we have a global crisis. So I see this as a, an incredible moment that every day we have limited time to change. I would say one of my top priorities is getting CMS to be a leader in the healthcare equity space. And so all, and, and while that may not sound grand, I think that's what I see as the ability to make health equity live beyond my tenure, that all of the senior leaders at CMS are thinking about how can we collectively collaborate to use all of our levers to advance health equity and how can we be more intentional? So I think in, in previous policy iterations, people would just assume that by doing X or Y or Z that health equity was going to be improved. Instead of being intentional and saying, are we measuring what we care about? Do we know that the interventions that we smart people think are going to work? Do we actually know that they work? We don't know that, we need to actually measure it. So part of my primary goal is to make sure that across our programs, we are thinking not just about the Medicare lever, not just about CCSQ and their space, not just about Medicaid, but across the continuum, are we thinking holistically because you all, providers, health plans, people experiencing in our programs don't see us, don't experience the healthcare system in the silo. We should all be rowing in the general same direction. So that is actually my biggest priority of, of really trying to get the entire agency thinking in that way, thinking in a collaborative way so that we can be part of the overall healthcare system. We are a huge lever. And, and, and so that's really what I want us to be at CMS. So, so speaking of yeah. measures, how will you measure success? When will you know that that's all that's worth? So what we've done, we've taken the six pillars and have uh, many cross-cutting initiatives, some of which you're starting to see, some of which are being rolled out um, this month. And, and you're seeing, we are getting really granular, like for coverage, we have the, these are the things we're gonna measure. Very excitingly, we had set a goal at the beginning and the open enrollment blew the goal out of the, um, out of the uh, park. Oh, park. So we said, oh, well, I guess we have to change the measure and up the ante. But across all of these, um, you know, all of our cross-cutting initiatives, we're measuring it in very specific ways. And then I would say, you know, these are these should all be very public. Maternal health is absolutely at the top of my list. And I think one of my happiest moments so far was with being with the vice president in at the White House and and elevating the issue of maternal health. And it was so moving for people with lived experience, as you just heard from the last panel, to actually be able to talk at the White House about what their experiences had been. Um, after I did a panel with members of Congress and, and also people who, one of whom had lost her daughter, and just the emotion of being able to elevate this issue and I have policymakers saying, we're gonna do something about this, was a tremendous moment to really lift up the underserved and, and really say, we are gonna take action. So that's one where you've started to see what we're doing, we're gonna continue and, and really are gonna be working with all of you and inviting you to, to come to Baltimore, to come to um, the Humphrey building, to really engage with us about how we can work together. But it's, again, it's all about measurement. So that's one area of real focus. And I'm really excited about us using the Medicare lever, even though Medicare does not pay for that many births. <laughs> 
providers and others. Not yet. <laughs> Not it's coming. <laughs> it is so true. But that it's it's part of the process, right? Like it is part of the healthcare system. And so hospitals can report on what they are doing because um, to the Medicare program and using the, the quality measurement to make sure we are measuring. Again, make sure we're measuring things that matter. Make sure we're including what the people who we're trying to serve care about. Because often as we talk, to actual people, they care about things that are different than what we as policymakers um, may do. So those are a couple of things, and I could go on and on. Topic-wise, mental health, huge crisis, huge um, area of focus for the department, um, and and for us collectively, and down so down the list. But what is top of my list is getting the whole agency to think this way on every policy we make. And, and I've already seen just the difference in um, the answers I get back, the thought that people put in, um, into it. And then maternal health, that's something that is just, it's embarrassing as a country that our, our health outcomes are what they are. And we, we have got to turn that around. That's great. So traditional Medicare, obviously still some equity issues. There's a piece, op-ed piece in the Washington Post today about a poor woman on Medicare who had a really bad set of outcomes around COVID nursing homes and not strictly speaking Medicare, but that interface between Medicare and long-term care, obviously still problematic, Medicare Advantage. Mm -hmm. So Medicare Advantage obviously has been a target of some criticism of late uh, for all the things it does that uh, people don't like relative to traditional Medicare, like costing more per beneficiary. On the other hand, there are all these supplemental benefits now, which are clearly of benefit to lower income populations. The patient experience data that CMS has seems to suggest comparable patient experience between blacks and whites in Medicare Advantage. How do we think about Medicare Advantage from the standpoint of equity going forward, do you think? So I would say a couple of things. I will sort of say and joke, I don't care what M you're in. I just want you to have care that is working and, and makes sense. And I really mean it. I want Medicare beneficiaries to be able to choose between whether they want to work, enroll in traditional Medicare or Medicare Advantage. It makes sense to have choice within reason. You don't need 100 choices. You need, but you should have decision-making uh, abilities. And so I think it's important that we have um, robust efforts on both sides. I think that we have to, we of course have to care about what's happening with cost. And one of my questions and one of my focus on Medicare Advantage is we should be seeing something good and better than just overpaying relative to traditional Medicare. And so I think one of the things you'll see is if our focus on really making sure we're measuring what's happening. I mean, I think there's just tremendous opportunity, especially for dual eligibles where they're already in two systems of Medicare and Medicaid. I, I mean, Medicaid managed care has grown so much from where we were say 10 years ago, there should be coordination. So one of the things I wanna see is, do we see better coordination with MA plans and Medicaid managed care than we do with traditional Medicare, et cetera? So part of it is measurement, and that's why you're starting to see us talk about how health equity index. And I agree that a lot of times the patient experience is really similar by race. Are we seeing um, interventions that are working that are different than just if we paid, if we added a benefit to traditional Medicare, we'd get the same outcome. And so that's one of the things that I think is important. I think also um, when it comes to traditional Medicare, that's one of the reasons why the Innovation Center is so incredibly important about really testing what other things may need to change and evolve about traditional Medicare. And certainly coordination of care is such an, a critical issue. And I hope you're seeing Mina in her space, Liz in her space, Lee in his space, we're really trying to get all, all of these three centers and, and Dan too on the Medicaid space to really think about how are we approaching value-based care? How are we making sure that we are 
to the extent that we have authority, moving the policies in ways that are gonna deliver better outcomes for people, really having a very person-centered focus, making sure we're measuring so that we know what's working and what needs to change. Um, and, and that's how I see the MA lens as a, um, not, not a need to demonize one side versus the other, but really for us to say, okay, we need to make sure we're using our dollars well. So we need to really evaluate what's happening. And there may be changes that we need to make, whether it's as an administration or, um, or for Congress to make sure that both programs are viable for um, the future Medicare beneficiaries, which will be one day. Well, and staying on the topic of value-based care and alternative payment models, one of the issues both you and Liz have talked about is getting more providers who are working more with these populations into those models, safety net providers, yes. who, who traditionally may not have the tools, may not have the resources, certainly don't necessarily lack the ability, or certainly don't have the ability to take on a lot of risk mm -hmm. in risk-based models. How are you thinking about pulling more of those entities into these models? So I think this is to me, the key, one of the key parts of health equity is not just the underserved. It is making sure we are engaging the providers and the organizations that serve the underserved. So whether it's a safety net, whether it's community-based organizations, we have got to figure out how to integrate um, integrate them into our programs. And we've seen it during COVID-19. And, uh, and again, many of in the private sector are really thinking about this and able to do it maybe even faster than the government about saying like, how did we get people vaccinated by churches and, and local groups that people had relationships with, trusted partners? We have got to engage those kinds of organizations. That's gonna require us, and, and here is the tension, that is gonna require us to slow down a little bit and to make sure that we're bringing them along and not one size fits all. I don't know, um, Liz has brought some people into our team who come from a state perspective, who say like, if you want states to do innovation center models, you gotta think about the state side of it. And so I would say we are trying to make sure that we are bringing in the perspectives of um, stakeholders that we don't talk to as much into our work. It, it will take time. And I think we all get frustrated sometimes with, we wanna solve the problem fast. Um, and, and there are gonna be challenges like, uh, you know, specifically around some of these entities aren't going to want to, or aren't able to enter in risk-based contracts. We're gonna have to think about how do we, how do we integrate them in? We may not fully have authority to do that in our own space, but really highlighting that we have to do this. Like we have to figure it out and, and really taking the time to engage and figure out how we adjust to incorporate them. So you brought up states and I, I want to drill down a little bit more on that because as you said, first of all, you can't make all the states come to the table. That's They're right. going to have their own minds about what to do, yes. particularly in the Medicaid space. But as you think about strategies to engage more states and more Medicaid-based reforms, since, as you said, so many of the states have already moved to manage Medicaid and, and MCOs in Medicaid, there's at least the beginnings of the platform to do even more. What, how, where would you set your sights in terms of uh, what would success look, look like, like truly innovating at the state level in conjunction with the federal government? So I think that we in DC and in the DC space can often overlook what's going on across the states. And Dan Sai, who you all know is our center head um, for Medicaid comes from a state perspective and Massachusetts, uh, it's Medicaid programs, one of the most innovative in the country. There are several um, who really are innovating in different ways. We need to make sure that we are bringing some of those learnings in to our work. Does Medicaid have something to teach the Medicare population as we, as the marketplace matures? Are there things that we bring in? Um, the Innovation Center Authority is a little bit tricky when it comes to, to Medicaid. And so it may be that we bring them as the to the table, but they're gonna ref move those reforms um, uh, you know, through their separately. own, separately through their own reforms. But I think a lot of it is we have, a, we have 
several leaders who come from a state perspective who are engaging with the states. Um, they just finished a conference where both of our leaders were um, on the Medicaid side and Ellen Muntz on the Sasayo side, really trying to hear what's top of mind for them. And when it comes to some of our top issues like maternal health, mental health, they're key. Like we're not going to solve this at a, at a federal level nursing homes. Um, we have to engage them. We have to think about um, how we approach them from the federal side. Um, and, um, you know, and, and I see them as equal partners in our discussion about how do we engage stakeholders to, to move, in, move in these directions. So you've got an assemblage of uh, health policy wonks here, but also some providers. And I, I certainly uh, represent a provider group. What do you most need from your partners at this point to make sure that you're able to meet those targets that you're set, you've set before yourselves of getting not just pulling all the levers of, that CMS has, but really fully engaging uh, all of us in moving toward a, a more robust equity. CMS really wants to engage and we wanna engage very, um, very specifically like on all of these reforms. I think what I would love to see is us all to be very real about understanding that some of these things are gonna require change, right? And, uh, you know, people don't always love change. It's not always the best. Even sometimes Stop. you're right. <laughs> right. Even sometimes you're happy with an unhappy, uh, a not so great situation if it's predictable. And I think to advance health equity, we're going to have to think about things a little differently. Um, and so I think on some of these difficult, we have some challenging um, healthcare system issues. Um, that we collectively need to work on. Um, but I think really coming with a will willingness to think, should we do things differently? Would we be willing to give up our predictability to um, you know, move to, to new spaces? But, and to really appreciate that we're not gonna always get it right, none of us. Um, that's what we need to measure it, figure it out adjust if we need to. And, you know, just, but I would say the, the uh, the biggest ask is gonna be for us to be bold. If we shoot for the moon and don't quite make it, we'll be, end up better than not trying at all. Um, and really, you know, as, as we start rolling out some of the things that are priorities, we'll really be asking the private sector to come to the table and say, either partner with us or make their own, um, uh, their own commitments, which I know, again, so many of you are. It's not that we have all of the answers. It's more that what I would like to see is us move with alignment, because if we're moving in similar directions, we're more likely to achieve our goals. And do you think those the toughest pieces are going to be getting institutions to change in order to reduce care disparities or confront structural racism or what what do you think, what do I think the are the toughest step? things I think it's really about um, I think the toughest things are going to be there are not infinite dollars and we have so many priorities I mean I mentioned the ones that are top but we didn't get to cancer we didn't get to you know and I know you've been talking about so many things but there are so many things that we have capabilities of solving but um, they're competing, right? We haven't talked about sickle cell, which is something that um, is, we, we could be doing a lot in that space. So they're just competing priorities. And I think really trying to make sure we're harnessing, um, harnessing the energy and not looking at it as a pie that we're, you know, who's going to get my piece of the pie, um, which is often how- It never happens in healthcare. I, exactly. So um, I sound very optimistic and, you know, idealistic, but I, I know, it, I, I don't mean to be, uh, to, to know that it won't be tough, but I think that's going to be the difficult piece of saying some of the things to achieve are, everybody wants to reduce disparities. Like there's not, I mean, there's, I, I would- venture to say there's no one in the room who opposes that it's actually moving the system well, so to do up. that 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 will be challenging especially if people disagree well challenging indeed but we're all very gratified that you're leading this extremely important effort and we wish you all the best 
Thank you. Thank you so much. And now I have the pleasure of welcoming Jillian Sandler Schmidler to the podium. She's the deputy director at the Duke Margola Center in charge of education, all kinds of other great things. Yeah. Jillian, welcome. Well, thank you. I get to have the, the great um, ability to, to actually get you guys going to the reception. So before we transition there, I want to thank you all for being with us here today. Um, and I want to have you spend some time during the reception focusing on the educational programs and, and the, the students that we have involved with the center. And so for many of those that are here in DC, this is probably a part of the center that you don't see as much, but we have a very active group of students. And as you've heard, there's a really need for some of these change makers moving forward. So I do want the students that are in the room, if you could all stand up. Um, we have some both some existing students and some past alumni. Oh, and they're they're oh, they're in two groups over there. <laughs> so, so um, I want you to take some time to get to know these students, um, and uh, they're they're wonderful and they are incredibly inspiring. I also want to thank members of our Duke leadership that are here today. We have President Vince Price. Uh, the Chancellor, Jean Washington, and then uh, three of our deans, Dean Mary Klotman from the School of Medicine, Dean uh, Vincent Guamo Ramos from the School of Nursing, and Dean Bill, Dean Bill Bolding from the uh, Fuqua School of Business. So please also find time to chat with them. Um, and lastly, just a, a quick thanks uh, to Alexandra Real Estate Equities and Advi for helping to make today's events possible. And now please go enjoy the reception. Thank you. <laughs> 